contacting person. Um, next slide, please, Tammy. So just as a little background about what Noen the Caribbean is, um, actually my very first meeting as the coordinator for um, for CCART, the Southeastern Caribbean Regional Team, um, was in San Juan in November of 2009. And we heard a lot from partners and NOAA staff about um, the need for, for better communication, better coordination, better collaboration. Uh, kind of across the different offices and with our partners in the Caribbean. And out of that recognition kind of came, um, the, was, was really born um, NOAA in the Caribbean as a way to just improve that ability for people to share, to learn about what each other's doing and perhaps foster more collaboration. The, the group itself is is kind of large. We have a large mailing list for our, our newsletter that we'll talk about, but but most of the kind of decision making is through the executive team. And I'll show you who that is in just a moment. We we meet monthly. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have the larger community group with our bi-monthly meetings, and, and probably many of you are involved in that. And uh, we welcome you joining us uh, for the, the yeah. annual partners meeting today. Next slide, please. So this is your executive team. This is the group that um, makes, kind of helps keep NOAA in the Caribbean moving from day to day. Um, and I guess that's all I need to say about this group. Uh, we're, if people are interested in, uh, in joining the executive team, uh, please let any of us know. Um, we're happy to have have others join. Next slide, please. So the, the sorry, um, the main kind of products that we have for NOAA in the Caribbean uh, are our quarterly newsletter that has quite a wide distribution, um, our web page, which is uh, kept on the um, regional teams uh, website, our bi-monthly community group meetings. So those are typically webinars about things that are ongoing, products, um, partnerships, uh, ongoing programs in the, uh, in the US Caribbean mostly, but also wider Caribbean. And then our annual partners meeting, um, which as I said, we, we had hoped to have in, in person this year, but hopefully we'll be back to that uh, next year. I did want to say too uh, that while my first NOAA in the Caribbean um, kind of meeting was that November 2009 CCART meeting, uh, this will be my last um, NOAA in the Caribbean meeting as the CCART coordinator. I am retiring in about oh, nine days now and uh, just want to thank everybody for your participation in NOAA in the Caribbean. I think it's been a, a valued asset for um, doing what we set out to do, which is improving our, our coordination and communication. And so here's ways to get in touch with us. Um, Sammy will actually show these again later um, at the, towards the end of the meeting. So if you don't get a chance to scan those now, uh, feel free to do so um, when she shows them later. Next slide, please. And so what we're trying to do today, um, we're going to uh, have updates from our NOAA and partners, and we've selected two themes for today. We're going to be looking at um, climate change and, and kind of nature-based infrastructure solutions, and then we have a session on the sargassum issue, which everybody is somewhat familiar with uh, in the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, Southeast U.S. now. And so the other other objectives are uh, to really continue creating this this community. Of, of folks that are working in, in the US Caribbean, somewhat larger Caribbean as well, to gain knowledge from what others are doing, um, but to establish, you know, keep these partnerships alive, keep these contacts alive, make new contacts for people who can, who have similarities in the work they do down there. And then finally, again, we, we really try to work on what are the, the big issues uh, that we can bring people together to, to help tackle these issues. And so, we have the two that we've identified here today. And so next slide, please, Sammy, and then I will wrap up with this is our agenda for today. Uh, the welcome and intro that I'm doing now. 
and then we'll talk about climate change and nature-based solutions. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then we move into our sargassum session, and then Sammy will provide some comments at the end. And with that, Jessica, I will turn it back to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Gino. Um, before we get started with our first uh, session, I just wanted to note that all questions will be taken during the um, discussion panel at the end after all of the speakers for the session are done presenting. Um, and that will be done via the chat option. We'll, I'll go over that again uh, as we start the panel discussion, but I just wanted to, to throw that out there. So I'd like to introduce the moderator for our first session, Ms. Colette Carnes. Uh, she is a biologist for NOAA's Fisheries Office of Protected Resources. She works with the Endangered Species Act. She has been involved with issues related to natural infrastructure, including being a NOAA representative and co-author of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers-led guidelines for natural and nature-based infrastructure. Um, so take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jessica, for the introduction. I'll get us started by introducing the first speaker of this session, um, Dr. Jared Bowden. Dr. Bowden is a senior research scholar at North Carolina State University. His research is primarily in the area of applied climatology and modeling with a focus on climate change applications. In recent years, Dr. Bowden has focused on regional climate change within the U.S. Caribbean with an emphasis to resolve the island climates using regional climate models. His presentation is entitled Climate Change Projections with a focus on resolving the U.S. Caribbean islands. So, um, Jared, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Colette. Can you hear me there? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, while the presentation gets started, um, I'll say that you know, being from outside the islands and, and becoming integrated as part of the National Climate Assessment, the fourth and now the fifth National Climate Assessment, I've truly gained a love for the islands and uh, and some problems that I think um, I, I want to discuss and, and highlight that I think are very important when we start thinking about climate change. Um, and so today I'm just going to talk about um, uh, climate change, but but in a slightly different perspective because I want to think about resolving the Caribbean islands and and uh, and and the challenges that exist and why why it is extremely important that that we have some information about this. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned, I, I want to talk about what are the growing risks um, with respect to climate change for the Caribbean islands. Of course, there's a there's a there's a lot of emphasis on on hurricanes, and um, and there should be uh, uh, hurricanes. We know have created a lot of problems um, for the islands, and uh, and and is a growing risk, um, especially as the rainfall from hurricanes become more intense. Um, and these storms as themselves can become more intense. But but what I want to focus on is slightly different. Um, I want to talk about the mean changes in the island climate, and uh, and and in particular things like mean annual rainfall and mean temperature. Um, what do we know, and, and and what are some of the limitations when we go to thinking about resolving the Caribbean islands? So next slide, please. So this is very typical. Um, uh, plot that you, you may have seen or, or you can actually create yourself. It's, an, it's on an IPCC tool. And, uh, and for instance, here I'm just showing you towards the end of century for a very high greenhouse gas emission scenario, the mean annual temperature change um, respect to uh, uh, contemporary climate here is 1986 to 2005. And in general, when you when you look at this, what they tend to do is, is they tend to pull out these regional averages and you get a base sense of of how much um, increase is happening but some of these numbers are, are very hard to kind of pull out and, and look at so I want to take a look, closer look at this and not just look at one scenario but look at a bunch of scenarios from these GCMs. so if we can go to the next slide please so here's um, um, the annual temperature change. Uh, this is basically mid-century. You remember that, that I just said 86 to 2005 is that historical period that I'm focusing in on here. Relative to that, 
um, if you're on the left hand side is is a middle of the road greenhouse gas emission scenario the SSP 245 for, for CMIP 6 the 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 um, global climate models for the couple model into comparison project the, the latest and greatest and and, uh, and what you'll see and I try to put the numbers here to give you a sense of, of how it looks because in general you'll see that it's fairly homogeneous in terms of the changes, um, no matter which scenario you're looking at throughout the Caribbean, um, because most of it is is resolved is basically water points within the global climate models. But if you look at between mid-century and end century for the SSP 245, you do get warmer, but um, you don't get as significantly warmer because policy and mitigation will make a huge difference within the Caribbean. And uh, if you go to the right-hand side, um, if you look at the, the higher emission scenario, which is the SP 585, and you look at end century um, versus mid century for that scenario, you can see that it, it basically more than doubles. And so um, this is this is important to, to think about in terms of like policy. And uh, but if you if you start comparing across all these these scenarios here, um, you'll start seeing that basically if you're going to keep things along the SSP middle of the road scenario, you're basically less than two degrees C even at mid-century for a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. I'm going to show you in a few minutes um, that that uh, when we start resolving the islands that, that these changes are probably underestimates in terms of the mean changes in the climate that we may anticipate within the islands. If we go to the next slide, please. Next, I want to talk about rainfall changes. And um, from the CMIP-6 models, if you go to the high greenhouse gas emission scenario, um, you'll start to see something that that's kind of pops out is, is that if you look at any any of the islands that exist within within the entire world, um, the Caribbean sits in a place where there's substantial drying due to changes in um, a semi-permanent high pressure system, the North Atlantic subtropical high, and uh, and these changes are going to be significant um, if we keep going down a high radiative forcing scenario. And in particular, if you look at the collection of the models and you go through time here, um, and basically uh, what you're looking at in that bottom under this spatial plot is a time series out to, to 2100, and it goes from January through December. But basically that middle part of that is the wet season. And and you'll start to see that the, the global climate models are indicating, hey, there could be a really significant problem in, in terms of the amount of rainfall um, declines that you would see in the wet season for this type of emission pathway. And so that's another challenge that we have to think about and really comes back to some policy implications. But if we go back and we look at the, if we go to the next slide, look at the actual numbers for the Caribbean. And uh, and again, this is relative to that base period of 86 to 2005. And and basically you'll see, you'll see that um, Basically, by mid-century, around mid-century, we're seeing, you know, 10% reductions for the highest emission scenario, which is on the right. But the big challenge is, is that, as I, you just saw in the previous slide for the wet season, is, is that the models are indicating huge reductions in precipitation on average um, for, for the Caribbean region. And here you can see for Puerto Rico and the US VI, you're talking about in century for this high emission scenario exceeding 25%. And uh, and so relatively saying, you know, if you're going around and you're thinking about emission pathways reduction in the SSP 245, you'll see that that still stays around 10% around. And so um, and so there's there's few changes um, that, that we may anticipate for a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. But remember that 27% because um, we're gonna be talking about that a little bit in a minute when we start resolving the islands. So if we go to the next slide, please. So um, one thing that I, I specialize in is, is doing regional climate model projections. Um, and I focused in on uh, Puerto Rico and the USVI in recent years, and I've completed some simulations for a higher greenhouse gas emission scenario down to two kilometers. And what does two kilometers really get you in this sense of, of resolving the islands? And I'm just demonstrating Puerto Rico here, is this that, well, one thing, there's several things that happen is, is that you start to resolve the, not only the topography better, but also the land use change. 
or the land use itself. And and for instance, um, in you can start to see in that purple down there at two kilometers, we can even see the city of San Juan. And so these type of things are very important in terms of um, picking up urban uh, heat island effects as well as um, known gradients and precipitation such as going from a, a, a basically a tropical rainforest around El Yunque to the subtropical dry forest towards the southwest portions of the island. So um, if we go to the next slide, please. So the global climate models, as you saw previously, they're about 100 kilometers or slightly greater for most of them. And, uh, and basically you don't really see, but maybe possibly you'll see if the majority of this uh, box is is land it'll pick it up as a land point and may be slightly different than surrounding oceans but for the most part it's still most of these are saying that this is ocean areas <clears throat> and with a regional climate model these aren't like statistical downscaling these are actual model physical model projections that use um, uh, the equations of state to basically think about how the climate may change in the future just like a, a, a global climate model would do for for this and so it's very similar to a global climate model but it's an atmospheric type of approach of looking at, at how um, the islands may change in terms of the, the, the climate and the atmosphere so if we go to the next slide please so the problem with um, regional climate models is, is that they're very computationally expensive and uh, you can't have for the most part at two kilometers um, unless you invest a lot of resources a lot of realizations of the future climate for many different scenarios. So you have to start to tease out what can you learn from a few realizations that may be important for the islands. And that's what I wanna talk about here. And so what I'm showing you here on the left is one of the global climate models from, this is in case of CMET 5, so a prior generation of global climate models. And this is a high greenhouse gas emission scenario at mid-century. And so this is looking at the same temporal time span as what we do on the regional climate models. So that two kilometer simulation um, for that same GCM that we're downscaling. And so several things stand out. Is this that if you look at the temperature change on average from the global climate models, you don't really see much difference between land and ocean. Maybe land, you start to see Puerto Rico, it started to pick up, it's slightly warmer than what you than the surrounding oceans. But if you go to the dynamical downscaling or the regional climate model approach on the right hand side, it's much larger. Um, and it's, it can be almost uh, more than a degree C warmer than what you would um, anticipate from, that you would get from the GCM itself. And another thing that you look at is, is that there's large differences in, in maximum versus minimum temperature changes. And uh, if you look at the mean temperature change for minimum temperature, it's fairly homogeneous as you see on that right-hand slide. Well, for maximum temperature, it's not. And, and the reason why that you'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, is why the maximum temperature um, it looks so, uh, not not as uniform is because of the drying and and basically how the drying impacts the the heat fluxes within the island but um in general uh there's there's a couple things that stand out here is just that for minimum temperature it's fairly homogeneous and it isn't as large as the changes in maximum temperature actually the observations within the island are are not currently trending this way and um there's a reason why uh, minimum temperatures within the island are typically warming faster than the maximum temperatures. Um, and if you look at this, we're saying the maximum temperatures is, is going to warm more than minimum. And uh, in general, if you look at the rainfall trends for, for instance, for Puerto Rico, there's no real large trend in precipitation, especially reductions in precip. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes that there are, as we anticipate with climate change, large rainfall reductions that we may see in the in the near future. And so, um, so just take into account here that that the maximum and minimum temperatures are are kind of going different than what currently the observations are showing, and that these temperatures are much larger. Remember, it's more than one degree C. That one degree C is can be as large as it can be locally as large as what the difference is between scenarios or or time frames that I showed in the previous four panel plots from the GCM. So. This, this uncertainty is fairly large and, and is something very important. So if we go to the next slide, please. So just for a key message for temperature is, is that the GCMs depict a greater than one degree CME warming by um, in century for middle versus high 
greenhouse gas emission scenario. Um, and uh, if you look at the uh, basically the, the high emission scenario, it can be like upwards more than three degrees C. That's from the GCM itself. But if you start to look at the regional climate models, you start to see large increases, which are much larger than what you would see in the GCM. And that these differences between the global climate models and the regional climate models that start to resolve the islands can be larger than the differences, as I just mentioned, between scenarios or mid-century versus end-century. So let's take a look at precipitation. Next slide, please. So here's a similar plot for that same GCM that we downscaled um, to two kilometers. On the left, you'll, you'll see that the, the amount of change is around 25 to 30 percent. Um, and uh, there's, there's not a real large difference here between the, the dry versus the wet season. Um, and if you go to the right hand side, this is the downscale projections. And there's a couple things that stand out is, is that the rainfall reductions locally can be much larger than what the GCM um, indicates. And it, it, could, it could exceed 10 to 15% of what the GCM um, indicates. But also there are some really interesting things that start to stand out. And if you look at what I've shown on the right hand side is the shaded is the rainfall reductions. Always we've been looking at the shaded rainfall reduction, but the contours are actually the model terrain height. And if you look at the model terrain height here, there's some places that you see in the higher elevations, especially for the eastern half of the island, that there's, I call it a buffer to the drying. And so they don't dry as much as, um, as what you would see on average from the GCM. So these are relatively important things to understand because these could be places where, for instance, species, if you think about refugees for species, how you would move species around within the island, these places may actually be good places to kind of buffer that amount of drying, for instance. And so there's really interesting things that you're learning um, from these model simulations, even though it's one realization of many that you would need to do to have a collection um, of what would happen um, within the islands. But it, you're starting to see lessons learned that the elevational um, component of the islands is extremely important to think about. So the next slide, please. So the key message in general for precipitations is, is that there's a large sensitivity in the magnitude of annual rainfall reductions um, across the Caribbean by the end of the century. Um, and that higher greenhouse gas emissions equals larger rainfall reductions. And there's significant policy implications um, related to that. Uh, but the GCMs themselves underestimate the, the complexity of the regional impacts. And um, here we've seen that um, the projections show plausible larger rainfall reductions by up to 10 to 15 percent locally than what the GCM would indicate. But at the same time, it also depicts a, an elevational sensitivity in the magnitude of rainfall reductions, such as we saw um, on the eastern half of the island in the higher elevations, for instance, in LUK, where changes may not be a, as large um, in terms of the drying. And uh, in, in general, the, the regional climate models that we've seen so far indicate rainfall reductions once you start to resolve the islands, both in the wet and dry seasons. So if we go to the next slide, and I'll be ending basically here, is, is that overall there's an increasing risk of aridity within the Caribbean islands as greenhouse gas emissions continues to increase. And this is the model output. This is something else you can get from, from models like this, is that you can look at things like soil moisture. And this is the top 10 centimeters, and this is the relative change in soil moisture for the wet season. And in this case, this is one of those places where we said, for instance, El Yunque, the rainfall increased, but actually the, evapor the evaporation demand is larger. And so there's still a reduction in soil moisture. And so that's why I think it's important as we think about warming temperatures and rainfall reductions, what that means for the island in terms of future drought, which I think is a, an increasing threat that, that we have to think about and how to adapt to. Um, so I, I'll end there and thank you, Colette, um, for, for uh, having me here today. All right, uh, thank you very much, Jared. I uh, appreciate the, the content. Um, so I will, uh, just as a reminder, say that all of the questions will be uh, taken care of at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and our moderator will be keeping track of those. So I'll take a moment now to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Patricia Chardon-Maldonado is a coastal and civil engineer 
with six years of experience in coastal morphodynamics, numerical ocean and weather modeling, and ocean observing. Dr. Chardon Maldonado earned a bachelor's in civil engineering and a master's in environmental and water resources engineering from the University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez and a PhD in coastal engineering from the University of Delaware. Dr. Chardon Maldonado currently serves as the deputy and technical director of the Caribbean Coastal Ocean Observing System and co-leads the design and implementation of the observational and numerical modeling components of that system. She has been involved in multiple research projects, measuring, analyzing, and modeling climate, weather, and coastal features, processes, and their impacts on socio-ecological systems, infrastructure, and communities in the U.S. Caribbean region. Um, uh, Patricia, feel free to take it over. Uh, we can't hear you. No? Nothing? Now? Uh, yes, we've got enough. Okay. Great. Good morning. Thank you, Colette, for the introduction. Thank you, Noah and the Caribbean, for the invitation. Um, I will be presenting about climate change impact on specific coastal and terrestrial ecosystems in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico using examples and statistics from different reports, papers, documents um, from federal, local agencies, academia, um, alongside peer review literature. Uh, part of the information that I will share today will be included in the National Climate Assessment Plan that I also um, you know, assist with Jerry. Next slide. So this community knows that coastal and terrestrial ecosystems provide numerous goods and service, services that are vital to the island's economies and the well-being of the residents, um, giving provision in services such as food and feed, regulating services such as climate regulation, cultural services as recreation, and supporting services as nutrient soil formation. Uh, but unfortunately, the changing climate is compromising under goods and services. Next slide. To mention some climate and non-climate stressor, this is just examples. We can have lie, extreme precipitation, droughts, the frequent and intense tropical cyclones, the steady increase of surface temperature, sea level rise, pollution, and deforestation. Of course, there are others, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of them that are related to the um, ecosystem selected for this presentation. Next slide. So focusing on five of the stressors, the observed and projected trends of temperature in this case is that minimum temperatures are increasing faster than daily average. And based on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, uh, and the Shared Socioeconomic Pathway, the SSP, and that Jared already mentioned, um, that says that if we don't take any actions, the temperature could increase to us seven degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. Next slide. Rainfall could significantly reduce um, and have a cut of approximately 33%, 33% in the worst case scenario. Next slide. There's a, there's a high confidence that the number of intense tropical cyclones reaching categories four and five would like an increase as the climate warms, and we have seen this um, from the last couple of years. Next slide. Sea levels will continue to rise, reaching 2.1 meters by 2100, and between 2.3 and 5.4 meters by 2300. This is the scenario of no taking no action or any type of mitigation efforts. Next slide. And the current surface. Um, surface ocean is 12% more acidic, and the atmospheric carbon dioxide has and seems to continue to increase. Next slide. These are stresses that significantly impact the ecosystem present now selected for these presentations. And again, we have seen uh, the different um, no expression of these type of, of stressors. Next slide. Next. 
Um, the coastal zone is the habitat of home of several ecosystems, such as sandy dunes, beaches, mangrove, salt flats, coral reef, and seagrasses. Best, best. High population density, concentrated development, and critical infrastructure, uh, mainly electric plants and uh, water treatment plants, are located within 0.6 miles of the coastline. Therefore, a changing climate and human effects will affect tourism and industries essential for economy and social feasibility. Next slide. However, not all negative impacts are induced by climate change, and we already know that human activities have exacerbated the situation. An example here is the extraction of sand from dunes and beaches for construction purposes, based on a study by Martinez and others in 1983. Approximately 2.5 million cubic meters of sand have been extracted from dunes in Isabela, Puerto Rico, northwest coast of Puerto Rico. This is equivalent to the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The photo on your left top panel shows the primary and secondary lines of dunes in Isabela with a considerable height and width and in perfect condition to protect us from storm. But unfortunately, we lost this protection. Um, you can see that in the bottom left panel that shows the current situation at the same stretch of coast. On, on your right side, there's some efforts by Vida Marina from the University of Puerto Rico, Aguadilla, that has been working to restore the coastal dunes by constructing wooden pathway to control food traffic and plant vegetation to settle and retain the sand. So efforts like this one that are mostly done by students are helping restore beaches and dunes and are, are contributing to the reservoir of sediment that could supply sand uh, to the beach during storms. Next slide. If we only consider the wave action and intense ra rainfall from hurricanes Irma, Maria, and Long in 2017, um, now we observe that over 12% of coral reef were damaged. Approximately 1.2 to 3.1 miles of beach uh, stretch were lost. Dunes eroded, as I presented before, and almost 33% of mangroves were destroyed. Here are some images uh, of the effect and damage left by Hurricane Irma Maria on the coast of Puerto Rico. You can see structure collapse. Coral reefs were completely destroyed, but at least they um, not protected for the wave action and the energy. Mangroves were completely dry or burned due to winds and water. And unfortunately, they are still in the same shape after almost six years. Next slide. So all islands in the U.S. Virgin Islands are vulnerable to short and long-term impact of coastal hazards. So understanding the, the effects of the climate change and its implication for income, benefit, and residents living close to shore helps to take action or decide to retreat or prevail. Uh, reports by Dr. Greg Wanell, professor of the University of, of Virgin Islands, present different scenarios and different risk values and coastal vulnerability values showing how the different islands for Virgin Islands will be affected due to coastal hazards, especially to sea level rise and storm surge. And I think this information is useful for the local people to understand what is going to happen if no action is taken or how to prepare for the future. Next slide. Another ecosystem is the coral reef. Coral diseases, such as the stony coral tissue loss disease, pollution, and climate change, considering ocean acidification, in this case, threatens them. Based on literature from NOAA and local agency, Puerto Rico is surrounded by over 1,930 square miles of shallow coral reef ecosystem. Meanwhile, the U.S. Virgin Islands have 187 square miles of coral reef and corals on hard bottom. Coral Reef Monitoring Program in Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands have shown a mean reduction of approximately 34% in coral cover over the last two decades. Here you can see some picture of, of these um, no diseases, uh, what would be a healthy ecosystem, a healthy coral reef, and then how it just gets degraded. Next slide. Based on in situ measurements, um, in this case in Puerto Rico, 
seems that this trend is not will continue. The surface ocean is getting warmer and more acidic. So if we focus on the top part of the figure in, in the middle, it shows the measurement of the MAP CO2 buoy that is um, now supported by CATICUS and the Ocean Acidification Program from NOAA. It measures the atmospheric carbon dioxide in Hawaii, which is the black line, which is in the Pacific Ocean, and Puerto Rico, which is the orange line, and here in the Atlantic, in the Caribbean Sea. And both show a positive slope. They have reached 415 particles per million in June 2021. And this is concerning. If we focus on the bottom part of the, of the figure, it shows how the sea water is getting warmer. That's a red line, and the pH is decreasing. These parameters serve as an indicator for an example coral bleaching events. On your right side, there's a time series of sea surface temperature measured by the uh, Caricus Oceanographic Data Buoy located off waters of Ponce, south of Puerto Rico. And the time series from 2009 to 2022 and shows a trend of of um, know how much they surpass, surpassing the threshold of for coral leaching of 20.5 Celsius each year. Again, another indicator of a changing climate. In the figure I'm just showing in the picture showing here on your left side is all the instruments that are installed on the ocean acidification buoy on the water and collecting different biochemical parameters close to the La Parguera Reserve, Marine Reserve. Next slide. Some just some important um, in the in the in the history important dates. In 2005, the U.S. Caribbean suffered a major coral bleaching event, and followed by a disease outbreak where the U.S. Virgin Islands lost nearly half of its corals in an extensive die-off. Major bleaching occurred again in both 2010 and 2019, and. The no, again, emphasizing that in 2017, hurricanes Irma and Maria struck the U.S. Caribbean coral reef with devastating force, and as I mentioned before, no, damaging approximately 12% of the coral reefs during that event. So this type of ecosystem provides a coastal protection, sand production, tourism, recreation, and fisheries. And due to the different changing climate and the extreme weather events, we have been losing the habitat. We are also including other type of the damages like land-based pollution and the management and restoration is needed then to provide again this type of protection. Next slide. Another source of, of, of impact is the sediment and, content, and contaminant runoff derived from various land-based activities that can also impact the coral regeneration, growth, mortality, and other services. Um, no, this is because they obstruct the sunlight, limit the photosynthesis of aquatic plants, and reduce the biological, uh, biologically available oxygen and water temperature could increase. Next slide. The other ecosystem selected is the Caribbean tropical forest. Forests in the U.S. Caribbean range from coastal mangroves and dry forests to forests on mountain peaks. We know that they provide many services, including coastal protection, economy benefits, cooling in urban environments, improved water quality, recreation habitat, and biodiversity protection. The projected changes in temperature and rainfall that Jared also presented in the previous presentation could impact the amount of fruiting and flowering, tree productivity and nutrient cycling, and also can cause wildfires. Next slide. So information here presented about the U.S. Virgin Islands, about the Caribbean forest area, is until 2014. But there is an ongoing forest inventory that will provide new observation and trends. So based on information, a total of 46,000 46, acres of forest area was estimated in 2014 for the U.S. Virgin Islands and for Puerto Rico around 1.1 million acres in 2019. Although this is more qualitative, we sometimes assume when we were driving after a stream event that uh, you know, the forests had uh, been impacted because of their physical aspect. But it's uh, based on, on surveys and information gathered from professionals, it shows that they're able to not remain adapt and still remain relatively stable. 
Next slide. <clears throat> Some important events that have impacted the Caribbean forests are like the, in 2000, in 1992, a drop occurred in Puerto Rico impacted the consumption and rationing without lasting effects on wet forests. In 1994 and 1996, between both years, severe drought on the island of St. John caused the mortality of approximately 12% of the trees. In 2015, a drought impacted the U.S. Caribbean, reducing the production of these forests. Therefore, if the forest does do not acclimate, acclimate to the drier condition or to the projected climate change, the forest could switch from carbon sinks to carbon sources. Most of the trees are already in their optimum temperature for photosynthesis, releasing more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So beyond this threshold, trees may exhibit a reduced ability to take up atmospheric carbon. Next slide. A research on tropical forestry ecology and conservation in Luquillas Mountain since the early 19th century continues to provide insights about the resiliency of these type of ecosystems. And they have been able to understand how they behave due to disturbances such as the human land use, landslide drop warning. And they have been able to see that the forest can reestablish within 60 years reversing the paradigm of the ecosystem are fragile, but still we need to consider the, the time scale that, uh, that is showing. So these advances of these great efforts of many scientists allow us to understand how different disturbances and regimen might affect this tropical forest composition, structure, and function. Next slide. Meanwhile, no, the next slide. Next slide. Okay. The other ecosystem is mangrove. I mean, uh, over the past 40 to 50 years, 40 to 50 percent of, of mangroves have been lost mainly due to land development and um, natural causes. Mangroves are you know, the level of defense in storm surge and hurricanes and mitigate inland flooding from heavy rains. Again, the event in 2017 caused widespread damage. And most of the observed were the red mangrove uh, were the more severely affected. Here are some aerial images of the damage of, of the mangrove mortality. And this event were noticeable even one year after the event. You can see the same condition that I'm showing here. Next slide. Another, no, another impact is the rising seas, which are anticipating to affect this coastal morphology, causing mangrove to maybe move inland and in true on dry forests, which could not affect the species that depend on dry, on the, these dry forest habits. Human encroachment prevents the mangrove from moving up to shore. But, uh, but however, both territories have literature on potential actions that could be implemented to protect the ecosystem, biodiversity, and nearby communities. And here are some images uh, of that um, locations. Next slide. Just to fin not finish the, the, the presentation, I want to share some benefits or highlight some specific trends and current states. So in 2014, uh, estimates of the annual value of commercial fishing of reach were 9 million for Puerto Rico, 2.0 million for San Thomas and San John, and approximately 3 million for San Croix. Coral Reef have an estimated annual value, economic value of, of 666 million for tourism and recreation. Mangrove have an estimated annual economic value of 25.1 million for carbon sequestration. Puerto Rico coral reef derived tourism generates nearly 2 billion in income. The annual Junque National Forest represents approximately 20% of Puerto Rico tourism economy. Healthy coral reefs can absorb up to 97% of incoming wave energy, potentially reducing the impacts of sun surge and flood in the hurricane. Next slide. So some talks that came to me while, pre while preparing this presentation are, it is crucial to rehabilitate damaged ecosystem for future disaster readiness strategies and protects residents' well-being and livelihood. Climate change is expected to exacerbate the degradation of the ecosystem. Therefore, the success of climate adaptation strategies will depend on reducing all sources of stress on the ecosystem, which seems quite challenging. Both territories are experiencing weather and climate change related hazards. However, climate research, observation, assessment, and modeling are more significant in Puerto Rico than in the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
it will be necessary to gather knowledge and information from different agencies to address these existing and pressing gaps in the understanding of climate impacts in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So with the current information, although we have a lot of knowledge, we need to share this in a way that everybody can understand and be accessible for all the audience. So next slide, and there will be new ones. Thank you for the time and for your attention. Thank you, Patricia. A lot of great information. Um, I'll remind everyone we're keep holding questions till the end. So right now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Lloyd Gardner. Hi, uh, we can see you and I'll introduce you just now. Uh, Mr. Lloyd Gardner is executive director of the nonprofit Foundation for Development Planning Incorporated. He is an environmental planner who has been involved in environmental management in the Caribbean since 1982 and has functioned as a consultant in projects and public poly policy initiatives in the U.S. Virgin Islands since 2000. Uh, his presentation is entitled, entitled Fostering Sustainable Development in the Caribbean. Uh, Lloyd, please go ahead. Um, we can't hear you. Hello. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Um, I was saying um, thank you, Ms. Carnes, for the introduction and thanks to Noah and the Caribbean for inviting us to present at this, uh, this meeting, this partners meeting. And I was asked to speak about the role of FDPI in fostering sustainable development in the Caribbean. Um, the Foundation for Development Planning is a public charity um, registered in the U.S. Virgin Islands and granted um, public charitable status by the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. The purpose of the organization is to engage in programs that lead to the sustainable development of Caribbean communities and our geographic coverage is the wider Caribbean. Um, I will try to make back and forth um, between sustainable development and focus on the um, climate change as the topic for this um, session. So if we go to the next slide, um, the our programs, we try to discharge this purpose through two primary mechanisms. One, um, by acting in conjunction with other institutions and programs um, supporting um, initiatives where we are able to do so. And there's also the intention to act on our own when the, the work that needs to be done is not currently being done by others, um, but is urgent. Um, too often, there are crit there's critical work that needs to be done that's not topical or it's not funded or it's not um, sexy, if, if you wish to use the, that word. Um, our program of work consists of um, sort of three, five outward facing uh, programs with three cross cutting, -cutting themes. Um, and as you will see from the next slide, we we say that the, that program of work actually is aligned with the sustainable development goals, um, the sort of the global agenda 2030, and, and in in the ways shown by by the slide. Um, and so we'll see from the next slide. Each program era um, that we showed you previously has we have a prior to project um, aligned with each program years. There are actually several ideas we're trying to pursue with um, all of these um, programs and, and projects, but each one has a prior to project. And thus far, we have submitted um, several projects, like the first three, for example, um, and some of we have done multiple versions of it. Um, we have not uh, been able we have no funds. Let's let's cut to the chase. We have not um, had these projects funded. Um, we have also entered into a number of, uh, well, not entered into. We have been pursuing a number of um, MOUs with institutions in the USVI and some collaborative arrangements outside the US Virgin Islands. Next slide. 
as we don't have projects that we're running um, from our institutions, our primary um, functioning at this point in time is in part collaboration with other institutions um, or through our public engagement efforts. This slide shows uh, some of the regional organizations, uh, well, intergovernmental arrangements in which we're involved. Um, the FDPI is accredited is an accredited NGO by the United Nations Economic and Sustainable Development, sorry, Economic and Social Council. What that means is that we're allowed to participate in as an accredited organization in a number of UN-related activities, um, whether meetings or, or, or activities on the ground, um, primarily through the regional councils. Um, and the region, these are global regions, that is. And there are some that are not um, region specific, um, such as the, the, the work related to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Program, and the um, SIDS, which is a Small Island Development States Program. So this basically shows um, the list where we have different roles in, in them, such as an observer in the Caribbean Environment Program, the UNEP Caribbean Environment Program, We've been functioning as participating as an observer since 2021, but before that, um, I have functioned as a member of one of the um, advisory, sorry, um, working groups under the Specially Protected Areas and Wildlife Program, one of the protocols, one of the three protocols of the of the Cartagena Convention. So we have these various roles um, in the intergovernmental arrangements at a regional and global level. And uh, we are pursuing, we have been pursuing um, participatory roles in, in a number of the regional um, intergovernmental arrangements, such as the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean and the Caribbean Public Health Agency. And uh, we have a list that we have been pursuing for some time. Next slide shows um, some of the ways in which um, some of the, sorry, is that, Yes, okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, next slide focuses on the um, ways in which we have, we are implementing our public engagement strategy to advocacy um, at to, to different mechanisms, whether in terms of public or in terms of the, the policy arrangements. Um, and it includes you know, presentations to groups and at conferences, presentations like these, but also at conferences on health, on tourism, on ecosystems, on you know, protected areas, and a range of, of other such um, presentations. We have been, we were involved. In, we meaning the FDPI was involved in um, the past two climate change um, project conferences in for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. One was in 2015, and the more recent one was um, 2022. And, and some of you hopefully um, participated in, in those. We were invited to participate in the climate, Caribbean Climate Justice Conference in 2022, which held, was held in Puerto Rico. Sorry, focus on Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, but held in Trinidad. And um, we did a presentation and we actually have started discussions with the host of that organ, um, conference, Cipriani College. Um, which we'll speak about later in terms of supporting their programs around just transitions and, and climate and issues related to their social justice programs. Um, we seek to do sort of public briefing updates, dialogues. Um, we've started that from sort of day one um, from our, um, I think in 2012, so close to day one since we started functioning officially in 2011. Uh, around sort of regional or global issues related to uh, sustainable development in, um, uh, and as they may be relevant to the Virgin Islands and certainly to the Caribbean. So um, we, around things like SIDS, around um, these global programs, we've done information sharing through en environmental and, and, and development networks and through e-groups. And the next slide will show some of the social media um, networks that we either manage or, or we share. So these are not all we use. We're just simply saying that we have um, these kinds of, of social media platforms. I wanted us 
explain as a slight difference in terms of how we approach social media. So for example, on LinkedIn, we have both a corporate page and a LinkedIn group that we, we manage. And the LinkedIn group really does not focus on the FDPI. It is a mechanism for people who are interested in Caribbean development issues who are on LinkedIn to discuss Caribbean development issues. And so anyone that is there can actually um, share information or start a, a, a discussion. Um, the same thing with the Facebook page. It is not there to share information about the FDPI. It is there as a way, in fact, the way it is structured, it sort of um, collates, um, well, it brings information on a range of issues produced by anyone um, to that space and anyone meaning, you know, news articles, uh, publications and so on. So it, it, it is, is a way to actually focus on the Caribbean and, and around issues that most of us may not normally be interested in, tourism, music, culture, um, you know, seagrass, what's happening from a national um, perspective, etc. Um, on our own um, website, what we do, we encourage um, the same kind of sharing in the, uh, through the mechanism of asking, inviting allowing anyone that is really willing to share perspectives, write articles in terms of this guest article, um, for submitting guest articles. And so um, that's the purpose, not the purpose of our website, but that's one way we use it in terms of public engagement. The next slide um, focuses on some of these collaborations I mentioned. Um, one of the old, old ones, since we're talking about Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, um, for the Caribbean Landscape Conservation Cooperative. I am not so sure what the status of the cooperative is at this point in time, but back in sort of 2015, 2016, um, when it was functional, one of the, the ways in which we cooperate was to function in what is known as a protected areas conservation action team. Um, that provided information, not just in terms of dealing with some of the global issues around um, the arch targets at the time, but also supported um, initiatives within Puerto Rico, um, dealing with the uh, how they sort of rolled out approach issue of sort of community management of, of natural areas in support of, of, of the tourism sector and how protected areas or conserved areas would actually support tourism as, as a way of sort of um, mitigating or if you want ad adapting to the economic um, pressures that Puerto Rico faced at the time. We have um, been in discussion with the OECS Commission for some time um, a number of these, let's just say a number of these initiatives have, have in different stages of development. Some have stalled and the ones that have stalled have primarily based on our resource um, capacities. Um, some are based on things happening in that particular country or with the group that we have been um, working with as a partner institution. And so in Jamaica, it's based on what's happening with the, with the institution. Um, in the OECS Commission is based on our capacity. Our civil society, um, the Cipriani College for Labor and Cooperative Studies is the one I mentioned that hosted the conference in, in Trinidad. And we're trying to work through with them, trying to define um, how we would support their programming and fit into their research agenda around um, labor, around cooperatives, and around um, sort of worker collectives in terms of both issues such as climate change, um, planning, and some of the other development issues. A civil society, we support the, currently we're supporting the work of, well, of the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute in terms of their Ridge with, I am a member of the Regional Advisory Committee for their Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund um, project in the Caribbean. This is a global project that are functioning in a number of, of, of regional areas that are critical ecosystem um, areas. And so the Caribbean is one of these hotspots and the Canary is the, is the implementing agency within the Caribbean. So we support that. Um, we're working with, FDPI is actually in discussion, working with a number of other non-governmental organizations to create what is called a SPAR consortium 
essentially an alliance of, of institutions that support the implementation of the Special Protected Areas and Wildlife Program um, that is managed, well, that's part of the, the Cartagena Convention and, um, and part of the, the Caribbean Environment Program. So those are, and we are, what should we say? We share information and support the work of, of other networks, um, but these are ones that we are actively involved in, 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 in developing either the, the alliance or supporting the work of others. Um, the government of the Virgin Islands, we have expended tremendous effort over, well, since day one, um, trying to be supportive of, the, of different programs, um, and that is still a work in progress um, in terms of how that functions. Um, we have been trying to establish knowledge production and learning networks, and we'll um, show you how some of that has worked in, in a minute. Um, one of the institutions that you might not be aware of, this is called the Virgin Islands Capital Resources Inc., is a non-governmental organization, um, a non-profit um, based in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and in fact supports community economic development initiatives for I've been trying to for quite some time. I've put some funds into it. And um, in the last several years, I've actually moved their program into uh, more discussion of um, community economic issues, um, community development issues. And so we have been trying to support their, they establish an online platform for the a discussion platform. And we've been trying to support um, that work as well. The next slide focuses primarily on climate change. So this slide around collaborations all over the place in terms of different kinds of issues. Um, the next slide focuses on um, climate change specifically. The, I am one of the authors for the, the Caribbean chapter. I, liked, I don't like the word Caribbean, US Caribbean, um, the term US Caribbean, so I tend to say Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, but the US Caribbean chapter of the National Climate Assessment, and that is, process is about wrapping up at this point in time, and the report should be out in, in the, towards the end of the year. And in 2018, um, NCA 4 was out, and there's a Caribbean, a US Caribbean chapter in there, not so sure what the uptake was, but we're, that's been done, and hopefully the role out of this report um, will be different. And there's, and um, we're trying, we're collaborating with the U.S. Uh, with the Ver UVI, University of the Virgin Islands, and some other institutions to sort of how that rollout will take place here. Some of the networks um, that we collaborate with around climate change is, for example, the um, CSIN and the Climate Caribbean Climate Justice Alliance, which is fairly new, was launched last year. Um, and again, back to the government of the Virgin Islands, we have been trying to support their um, work with them to establish a, a climate change and disaster risk reduction program in the in the Virgin Islands. And so, on the previous um, administration and the previous U.S. administration as well, when there was an initiative funded to do this. Um, we, we, we supported that in a number of ways, and so the FDPI is actually one of the institutions that is support, named as part of the Climate Change Advisory Council, which is not operational at this point in time. And as I mentioned before, we have been trying to do program development in this year with the Virgin Islands government. All of those um, question marks say that we're still working on it, and we'll see where it goes. Um, I know that there's the Department of the Interior provided funding um, for climate change adaptation planning for the insular years, um, and the U.S. Virgin Islands government has actually um, submitted an application, is likely to get um, the grant approved, and we'll see if we have, if we allow a rule in that in in the process. As, as that goes forward. So um, we leave it at that point. The next slide is basically just to wrap up by saying thank you. And um, we look forward to taking your questions at the end of the session. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Lloyd. That was uh, very interesting. A lot of great work. Um, I'd like to take this time to introduce our last and final speaker for this session before we have our question and answer session. Um, our next speaker is Edmundo Colón Izquierdo. He goes by Monday. Hi, uh, we can see you. Um, 
Edmundo is principal at ECO, a multidisciplinary firm he co-founded in 2005 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. His professional work encompasses a broad range of projects, types, and scales in Puerto Rico, mainland USA, Europe, Japan, and the Middle East. He has published articles for local newspapers and design magazines. His firm's work has been featured in magazines and newspapers, both locally and abroad. Edmundo is a licensed landscape architect and architect and a certified forestry and planting professional, as well as a 2020 to 21 Landscape Architecture Foundation Fellow. Um, his presentation is entitled Nature-Based Solutions and Stormwater Best Management Practices in San Juan's Financial District. So, uh, Monday, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, you can hear me right, right? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you. So, um, a little bit about myself. I'm an architect and a landscape architect. Um, and and I, my, my, my presentation is not going to be as scientific um, and as detailed as, as the ones before. Um, but I do work with um, scientists um, especially climate scientists and hydrologists, a lot. Um, and, and I think our presentation today will, although not that detailed, show you some of the stuff that we are doing here in San Juan. Um, I'm going to be talking about one project in particular, um, which is a privately funded project, although it should be probably a state funded project. Next, please. So a little bit about the context um for those of you who might not be familiar with san juan this is san juan in puerto rico this is the municipal the municipal uh, boundary of san juan and next san juan is has next san juan has 18 barrios or uh, neighborhoods if you will with plenty of sub barrios and has about 330,000 residents. Um, and San Juan is also next home to the San Juan Bay Estuary, which is which spreads over eight different municipalities and connects next. It's composed by major wetland systems, coastal wetland systems both fresh and palus and saltwater uh, wetlands and is also influenced by of course all of the upland um forest types that we have in the central region which san juan also is part of um and next san juan floods san juan floods uh, pretty pretty decently um if you will um and most of these floods happen where most of the people live which is in the northernmost part um between what we would call santurce and atorre next please i i want to focus on on some work that we've been doing in the financial district um and a project that we're currently involved with which is is more urban than than anything else um we are next please as as you will see in this image in this aerial image san juan you know with with all these great wetland systems that that you saw ab abstractly in a few images ago san juan is also pretty dense and so wetlands and people coexist in in near 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 proximity i'm sure most of you know San Juan um, pretty well. Next. So the financial district, which is here in this blue um, rectangle uh, or, or downtown, it's like like most other downtowns uh, anywhere in the States. We have, you know, the tall buildings and it, it kind of dies at night and is lively during the day or somewhat lively during the day. In our case, it is perfectly adjacent to El Caño Martin Peña, which is a, a wetland system 
that was completely on, encroached on from the 30s to the 1980s, um, if you will, um, by unplanned settlements. And in the late 80s, early 90s, what you see in the west part of the image where it says Caño Martin Peña, most of the residents that had been living there for two or three generations were, um, how do we put it, kicked out to make way for a, a, a transportation project, which is a, a water taxi type system called the La Cospreso. To the east side of the Caño Martin Peña, where you see the other dotted line, um, those communities that there are currently now eight communities and in 2004 they were able to convince the government to do a master plan an infrastructure master plan so that they could remain in place um, and live in a safe and healthy way this master plan i have been fortunate enough to work on the rethinking of this master plan, revision of this master plan, which we finished last year. And we finished a comprehensive infrastructure master plan, which tries to give them better opportunities to remain in place while also considering the necessary relocations that need to happen to make way for the Caño Martin Peña, which should be widen and dredge by the US Army Corps of Engineers soon. It's actually an ongoing project, again, another 30 or 20 year project, and also provide better infrastructure systems. So before we move on from this um, slide, some of these communities still don't have a sanitary system, um, which is part of our new infrastructure master plan, which I will not get into. We were, these communities and the financial district, they all drain towards the Caño Martin Peña, which is a major connection from the San Jose Lagoon to the San Juan Bay Lagoon. So it is, it, it's impacted and it impacts some of the major um, estuarine components, uh, water components in the San Juan Bay estuary. And this is really important. Next. So a little bit about the financial district, and I wanna give a little context on the history of this district before we get into um, the few slides related to the project that we are working. This, this financial district, like most financial districts, is you know, composed of several towers that host um, bank institutions, um, financial institutions, and it's mainly composed of two major highway roads. One is actually a federal highway, which is the one to the west, which is Muñoz eh, Rivera, Muñoz Marin Avenue, and to the east, I mean, it's north in this plan, but yeah, this is a um, rotated plan. And to the east is Ponce de Leon Avenue, which is avenue number one in Puerto Rico. So um, these are major connectors to both north, south, uh, Santurce, Rio Piedra, San Juan. Next, please. It was envisioned in the in the 60s, and there's a photo from the 90s. From from the 60s to the early 90s, few of the towers were built. This was thought of as a two-story city, if you will. So if you look at most of the old buildings, and there's a clip of them on the right hand side, most of them have their entries on, on their second level. Because at some point, I think it was Leon Creer with the planning board, they decided that this area of the city would have two, le two levels of, of communication. One which was pedestrian on a second story, and one which was all of the vehicles and service on a street level, or what we would consider now a street level. So most of the buildings have their main lobbies in a, in a second story, which actually made it to be a kind of like a strange urban area because most 
buildings up to the 90s had no real uh, street access or street vendor or you know street commerce as you would in, in other urban cities and you had to go to like a second story. Now in the 90s, um, the Aqua Espresso was built, which is this water taxi terminal that connected uh, the historic city San Juan uh, with Cataño and with the uh, financial district. It was actually pretty convenient, but it stopped working, I think, in, in the early 2000s. It wasn't apparently economically feasible. Now, while there were some buildings that were in place, you know, very urban-like buildings, there were also a lot of super superficial or surface parking lots and a power company vehicle repository, which lasted there for 30 years. Next, please. In the 2000s, in the early 2000s, the, the train system, the urban train system was built, and so was the Coliseum. And if we go to the next one, in the early 2010s, our current client and the, the, the institution that we're gonna talk about a little soon, did their major, their first major expansion. Banco Popular uh, of Puerto Rico is a major financial institution in Puerto Rico. It's, it's a local financial institution. And they were the first to build a, a building here in, in the financial district. It was the tallest building when they built it. It was 20 stories high. And in the two early 2000s or late 2000s, early 2010s, they did their first major expansion in over 50 years. This expansion included a, a movie theater area, uh, some new parking areas, and uh, to the south, which is on your right on the screen, a new entry and gallery space that is at street level. And this was sort of a game changer in the area because for the first time, people could actually walk into this financial institution, which also hosts you know, other uh, office buildings, other offices um, that people go to for different reasons, but also provided retail space on the base and whatnot. Um, the the Aquaspresso by this time, and you can see it on the left here, mm -hmm. became a shopping center and is no longer a, a functioning water taxi system. Next. Now, here's where things start to change for this stone, for the better. Um, in, in 2000, from you know, the early 2010s to, and then in the late 2010s, it was built. The, the bank decided to do another expansion. Now this expansion has very little commercial space or very little net rentable space if you were if you were to talk in, in, in economic terms, but added major public space components to, to the city, which frankly it doesn't have this area of, of San Juan, um, mainly because everything is privately owned. Uh, private buildings and banking institutions. Now, this game-changing project, which we were not a part of, um, also added something that had never been tried before, which was managing all of their stormwater on site. So there's a there's a, a, a pedestrian connection that connects all of this public area that you're seeing on the on the lower photo to the existing buildings, but through that bridge, there's also a connection from stormwater from the existing parcel to stormwater uh, system and management system on the new parcel where the green roof is. And this new project, including the parking lots to the side, managed, and they have been able to document it, 100% of their uh, design stormwater overflow or or the you know what what runoff would be so there is no runoff coming out of this uh, project which 
is really significant considering that most of this water, which is a lot, if you look at the area of this site, actually went into the Caño Martín Peña, which is directly north of this and water drains towards it. Next, please. Um, this diagram, although it's, it's, it might be a little hard to understand, basically explains how they're managing stormwater. All of the stormwater that is generated on the existing buildings um, are collected in, a, in what used to be a, a parking, a, an, an overstructure parking, which is now a, a roof garden, if you will, and, and, and a activity areas. And that is taken to the other side through the, the, the bridge that I mentioned that crosses over Munoz Rivera Avenue into cisterns, a pond, uh, some other ponds where it, uh, where the storm water quality is managed before going to the municipal water system. And some of it is recirculated back as nutrient rich water that comes from the ponds and fish and you know fish provide nutrients in water and is reutilized in the garden back in, in the plazoleta across the street for um, irrigation of uh, green roof type plants and, and some other systems. Next, please. And that is what we found um, in 2018 when we became involved in this project. In, in 2019 or 20, uh, late 2018, the project embarked on a much ambitious um, urban transformation project. Um, a, a stateside firm called Perkins Eastman was hired to envision a, a master plan that would transform the Ato Rey area and provide more public space opportunities and better public space opportunities for you know, neighboring communities, but also add space to bring people to live here in, in, in Ato Rey. Next, please. We were, in the beginning, brought in as a civil, um, civil engineering consultant to assess the infrastructure needs of, of this master plan. Um, but we also were responsible, nobody asked us to, but we were responsible um, for, for bringing in stormwater management BMPs or better management practices into the mix when when we started when we started looking at this new master plan uh the first thing we noticed is we had some cisterns we had some green roofs we have some green areas they weren't really connected to the larger master plan or or to any of the surroundings um in any way next please and we made a a new plan to integrate um, green infrastructure and stormwater retention and all of the potential uh, stormwater BMP systems that we could bring into the mix. Um, and while these weren't um, calibrated and, and the, the, the engineering um, calculations weren't done to to really assess the impact of them, because that wasn't the nature of the project back then, um, we did come up with next a, a, a diagram of where all of the opportunities to retain, treat, or manage stormwater in this master plan were, and made it a part of the master plan, the, the current master plan, which is planned for the future. I have one minute, I see. Next, please. I have two slides. So we are currently working and building two of the master plan buildings, the plaza building and the bridge building. Next. Um, these two are major building components of this master plan, which we had to tie in to the stormwater system that I explained a little bit earlier we're still retaining um, basically 100% of our stormwater runoff. These, um, 
these buildings have garden roofs, uh, roof gardens in different levels. We have underground storage facility, uh, water storage facilities, and also wetlands that are part of our, our system over, over surface wetland. Next. The other thing which is really important is that we've already started building city biosweds. In Puerto Rico, this is something that normally the city or the state would do, but unfortunately, um, it is on the private sector hands to really uh, manage their own sidewalks. And our scope right now is in front of the buildings that we are building. So we are implementing a system of bioswells that you know, they work with, with what we call the, the first um, um, ah, what the first purge, I think I, I forgot the name, um, which is you know what carries most of the sediment, and we will try and, and manage sediment and pollution in these um, biosoils, not necessarily water volume. We have made the calculations. There's no way of impacting significantly the the flood problem, especially with sea level rise in you know 10, 20 years. So um, this is what we're kind of up to and hoping that it will extend to the rest of the master plan and the city will take up and continue it, you know, as a as a model for future um, urban development. Next. Thanks. I told you it was only two slides. That's great. Thank you very much, Mundi. Uh, a lot of very interesting information. Um, very interesting to hear about the, the applications and the development of these best management practices. Um, so now we are at the end of the session where each of our presenters um, have, have concluded their presentations, but now we open it up for a, a panel discussion. Um, I'd like all the session one speakers to turn your cameras back on for the panel. Um, Jessica has been monitoring the chats for questions and I have the uh, questions here. I will bring those up and um, provide those for the panel to, to answer. So uh, the first question we have is, um, it's, it goes as follows. Does NOAA recognize the cause of climate change impacts is, is air, con, air pollution, uh, greenhouse gas emissions? And does NOAA recognize cumulative impacts, including air and land-based runoff, physical impacts from stronger and more frequent storms, as well as uh, abnormal sargassum inundations? Are all of these definitely resulting in adverse modification to critical habitat waters, uh, specifically for areas designated in the Caribbean for, for corals and sea turtles? Um, so I can, let's see, I'll, I'll pause for a second to see if anyone has any, um, would like to, to take a stab at that, or I can um, repeat parts of it if, if people on the panel would like to hear it again. So, um, All right, um, so I, I think that was a, a very um, in, involved question. There was a lot in there regarding um, some of the impacts to you know, um, ecological resources. And uh, it did seem that the question was directly uh, focused at, at NOAA. Um, I, I don't think any of the panelists are representatives of NOAA, so maybe we can table that. Uh, question for a moment, and I'll, I'll move on to these uh, other more targeted questions for our panelists. Uh, this next question is focusing on um, Jared, uh, if you wouldn't mind fielding this one. How do greenhouse gases affecting climate change behave? Um, in other words, are as they are created or emitted, do they move west with the trade winds? Uh, is there a residence time? 
to these greenhouse gases that factors into regional effects? Yeah, so greenhouse gases are basically pretty much like uniform radiative forcing. And so, um, but they do have different residence times um, and different levels of strength as to the warming signal. Um, and so for instance, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere longer, <clears throat> but methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas, but it has a shorter residence time. So, but they don't like necessarily, they're not like moving around with the westerlies. There's a difference between, um, we call them short, um, term like aerosols, right? And that there's aerosols and then there's the greenhouse gases. And so aerosols would be things like particulate matter, like from a smoke or a wildfire that may move into your area um, associated with like the change in the winds or something like that. So hopefully that, that helps. Okay, um, I, I think it does. Um, thank you for that. Um, our next question is, uh, for uh, Gramundi. Um, what happens to the collected stormwater um, and are there plans to expand your project to other areas? So collected stormwater um, hopefully seeps underground under, over time. Um, some of it, um, what is collected on, 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 on the site. Um, we have, so it, it's a complex system. All of the roof water goes to actual cisterns, cisterns for reuse. Um, most of that reuse water is going towards AC um, systems. They, they use water for, and, and that water gets evaporated. And the use of water for the AC systems in these major buildings is astronomical. So um, we have, I think it's like 400,000 gallons, I think, of, of cistern water that we collect, uh, rainwater from that if it overflows which we doubt it'll ever happen if those overflow they go to underground chamber systems these systems are the the chambers are collecting water from the gardens and from the plazas all of the public areas which is typically typically you know dirtier water so cleaning it for reuse would be a little bit harder um, mechanically, um, so that goes into the under, underground chambers. These chambers we have designed so that the outflow of the chamber is higher than the intake of the chamber, so that the water collects and stays there. We have a major issue that the water table is pretty high in this area, so it won't um, percolate immediately. It percolates slowly over time. Um, and hopefully, you know, most of it can go back to the to the um, water table. If and when you know there's overflow, then it goes to the municipal system, um, and that's you know the the only way to get rid of this water when it overflows. Plans for expansion, yes. So the, there's a master plan, which is basically three blocks. Of this, there is there is a, a an association called Codefin, which is basically like a homeowners um, association for the whole financial district. They have a plan to expand what Banco Popular is doing into a regional or you know district area thing, um, but um, this takes time, money, and a lot of commitment from everyone on on each side. And from the municipality, which I think they they're all on board, but that you know there's another commitment for you know money and funding, which is harder to get because these is, these are major investments. Uh, right, definitely. Um, thank you. And it does sound like um, with the, uh, the the climate modeling that that Jared spoke about about the reductions in the expected reductions in precipitations that solutions like these uh, stormwater management best practices are going to be um, even more important to, to wisely manage that that resource. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to uh, take a stab at the uh, the first question that uh, came into the chat uh, regarding NOAA and um, 
how we consider the effects of, of air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, impacts for runoff on, on critical habitat for corals and sea turtles. Uh, I can speak for myself. I, I work with the Endangered Species Act and in, in our analyses, when we examine the effects of federal actions on, on these uh, ESA resources like critical habitat, we do take into consideration the, the baseline conditions that are, um, that are present including those um, conditions that are caused by uh, anthropogenic climate change. So um, those, those sort of baseline uh, things that are already happening, um, the ocean acidification, the other effects from climate change are, are considered in our own analyses of these additional um, stressors that are occurring to the critical habitats from uh, whatever action we're considering in, in our opinions. So um, those, those are the questions that we had um, from the audience. I'll pause for a second to check in with Jessica to see if there are any uh, other questions that have come in. Um, um, yes, there's one that just came in. I'm just gonna read this one out loud. Um, for Patricia and Lloyd, what resources from the federal agencies would be most helpful for increasing coastal resiliency? More funding, more training, pathways to employment in situ. Patricia, you want to start? <laughs> I think it's just, and I think all of them, but we also need capacity building. Now we need more people that also want to know, assist us and then we have great colleagues from states that is helping. And um, there are a lot of opportunities right now in funding opportunities that we have recent, uh, received news. But I think we need uh, more support here. Paul, do you want to? Um, thanks, thanks, what you said. The, whoever asked the question, my suggestion would be that um, you keep this, that specific question in mind as the, NCA5 report rolls up because it's one of the issues that's addressed um, in there in terms of what's next, what needs to be done. Um, and the language, I think that's in the report, or the idea is that uh, two things are, are, are required. One is better alignment of local and federal policies. Um, as Ashisha just mentioned, there's a significant amount of funding for disaster recovery and mitigation of range of things on the different programs. And there needs to be an alignment within within the two sets of policies and programs that do one, make sure that the money is targeted um, for adaptation and mitigation where possible. But also some of the current investment actually helps with long-term resiliency of natural systems of, of, of built environment. Within that process, one of the uh, small digression, or oh, well, small addition, if I may, um, under the presidential executive order, President Biden in, in 2021, um, it required all of the, a number of the federal agencies to actually develop within a, a short period of time, I guess 60 days, I think it was in the order, um, plans to say how they would actually um, implement this, this 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 executive order uh, or that executive order and that was supposed to be um, a collaborative process with different federal agencies and then a number of, of of agencies identified as the leads. I think no I only saw two calls for comments um, in, in in from the versions one was from FEMA and one was from from I think NOAA. Um, dealing with fisheries and other issues and I'm hoping that by now um, last year when I checked because we wanted to do an update as part of the preparation of the regional chapter we, I couldn't get any information in terms of what the the status of those agency um, plans were in terms of implementing the executive order in the care in in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands so I'm hoping that that is one of the mechanisms through which this alignment of local and, and federal programming and, and policies will take place. So that's one. Um, two, capacity. The capacity is, is actually mixed in the sense that all of the, um, the federal agencies are very thematic um, and even at the federal level. 
they have lots of different programs even within each 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 agency what that does it places a demand uh, a stress on small communities to respond um, in a thematic basis so there's need for some a mechanism within that to identify what are the what's the best way to actually optimize those opportunities um, that will support us. Part of that is to build capacity and to, to enable local communities, non-governmental organizations, research institutions to act as partners within that process. So there is some capacity, but it is difficult for a number of those players to access um, the programs and to access the financing that would speed up some of some of some of the the action the climate related and other action um to some extent that's just because the federal government the requirements can be onerous to some extent that is a local government um issue in terms of access um and and working with those partners and how that that would work so the capacity is not as bad as we think it is um there are some partners we just need to align um the the actions and be supportive Part of the capacity is some of the work that Gerard mentioned in terms of we need to understand and plan for the longer term in terms of things around agriculture, design of urban areas, design of, of infrastructure, some of the work that needs to be done to migrate housing and critical infrastructure away from, from vulnerable areas. That is longer term work that require, I think, some federal capacity um, to really do that work because not just because the technical know-how and the computing um, capacity that you heard Jaron mention at the beginning of his, his, his presentation, but also because local organizations, local governments might be at their capacity to implement certainly things like recovery work um, and there's a even to manage the the teams that are coming in for for the action on the ground that itself requires local capacity to manage those teams and so all of those so capacity is a multifaceted um, issue that needs a, a discussion and, and needs a commitment from both federal and local governments in terms of how it is identified um, and, and, and mobilize along very specific and very strategic pathways to, to deal with climate um, planning and climate action. Those, I think, are the two biggest ones because, as Patricia mentioned, there is money. Um, here we're in the version, as we say, we cannot spend uh, all of this money. It's there. We just can't spend it fast enough. We've been warned that we might lose it. Um, in Puerto Rico, we've heard um, or seen where the money, it has not been released in a timely way. It's not taken up because of these sort of blocks, these glitches in the system. So to some extent, some of the work that needs to be done at federal level is helping to, to remove those glitches, to smooth out some of those pathways for uptake of resources and for, for working with, with our federal partners. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you both for, for your responses. Um, I think there was a lot of good discussion. Um, so we are, um, at the end of, of this uh, particular panel discussion. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank each one of our uh, panelists and our presenters. Uh, that was really interesting and, and valuable. Um, Jessica, I'll hand it over to you because I think we're going to break now. Awesome. Thank you all so much. That was great. The questions were great. Um, before we go into our 10 minute break, I just wanted to address some of the common uh, comments and questions that I got. Um, this presentation, this meeting will be, is recorded and it will be shared with the group um, with both English and Spanish subtitles. That'll take maybe a week or two to, to get done, but that will be shared out um, to everyone in the same way that the registration link was, was um, shared. Um, and then the presentations will be shared as well. Most of the presentations, some of them due to privacy and sensitivity um, issues will not be shared with the group, but for the most part, all of our speakers presentations will be shared. Um, keep the questions coming. Um, I'll make sure that those get discussed and enjoy your 10 minute break. See you guys back here at about 1055. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Bye.
Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your 10 minute break. We're going to get right back into it with session two um, on Sargassum. So I, it's my pleasure to introduce our second mod moderator, Dr. Emily Smale. She is the executive director for the GEO, the Group on Earth Observations for Blue Planet Initiative. Emily specializes in utilizing science to support informed decision making in the development of effective ocean conservation and development policies. Emily has been serving as the Secretariat Director of the GEO Blue Planet Initiative since 2015 and is a Senior Faculty Specialist at the NOAA University of Maryland Cooperative Institute for Climate and Satellites. Prior to working to support GEO, Emily worked in science policy and public science education. She received a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from Pennsylvania State University and a PhD in bi Biology from the University of Southern California. So thank you for joining us and take it away, Emily. Uh, thank you so much and thank you all for joining. Our first speaker in this session who is going to kick off our discussion about sargassum is Marlon Hibbert. Uh, Marlon is the director of the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Marlon is the director of the Division of Coastal Zone Management in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and he's currently working in Jamaica, Turks and Caicos, and various other jurisdictions in the Caribbean. He has over 25 years of experience doing this and is a proud graduate of the University of the West Indies, um, Mona Campus in Jamaica. And Marlon's going to be talking to us today about sargassum as a public health and environmental health emergency. And I will turn it over to you, Marlon. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, are you able to see me? I am not able to see myself, so I don't know if my camera is being projected. We see your presentation, but I don't see your camera. Okay, no one can see you. My apologies. So there, oh, there I, you are. All right. Yeah. So good morning, everyone, and and thank you for the Northern Caribbean coordinating team for inviting me. Um, the presentation is brief, uh, and I and I do want to leave questions a sufficient amount of time for questions. I think we we lost one speaker, so there should be, but with my shortened presentation as well, there should be more time for questions. As I know, this is a a very um current topic in the region currently this year as well as previous years. So the perspective uh, when Dr. Lisa Marie Karuba reached out to me uh, regarding making a presentation, it was because <clears throat> in July of last year, the governor reached out to President Biden and asked President Biden to declare a state of emergency for the island of St. Croix because we had an unusually large influx of sargassum into St. Croix in the Christiansted Harbor area that impacted the island's water production system. Next slide, please. If I'm, am I the one in control of the slide or no? I'm not sure. There we go. So the water production facility, the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority, produces both electricity and water for the island of St. Croix and also a sister plant on the island of St. Thomas and then via, via underground, underwater submarine cables, both energy and water are transmitted to the um, to St. John. <clears throat> the plant, uh, for those of you who are uh, may not have the geographical reference, is located on the north shore of St. Croix. St. Croix is 40 miles south, more or less, of the island of St. Thomas and southeast of the island of Puerto Rico. Um, in reference to Dr. Bowen's presentation this morning um, as it relates to impending decreases in rainfall for both the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico in the near future. For those of you who are not aware, and, and I'm sure many of you are, currently the Virgin Islands does not have any 
running sources are fresh water. So we have ephemeral streams that when we have heavy rainfalls, they run for a little while, dependent on the amount of rainfall, but we do not have any consistent sources of fresh water for the islands. Therefore, our water resources are strained. Um, we produce via reverse osmosis, utilizing seawater. Um, and my apologies, please let me. My apologies, I forgot to shut my door. Um, so water production in the territory is actually almost all provided by the Water and Power Authority. Now, not all of the island is in fact serviced via this distribution system. It's limited to uh, small sections of the island and most areas are in fact serviced by their own water harvesting uh, devices, uh, mainly the roof guttering to underground or foundation cisterns, um, which is mandated by law. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is St. Croix here uh, on the North Shore, and I'm, I'm hoping everybody is seeing my cursor, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but on the north shore of, of, of St. Croix, the plant is located just in that little belly uh, to, the, to the north. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the power plant, and this is what occurred. These are pictures of the event. And this was a few days, this was a better condition. Um, basically, what happened? And let me preface that by saying, I became the acting incident commander. The actual incident commander was Commissioner Jean-Pierre Oriol, um, but he traveled to the state of Hawaii and I became the acting incident commander afterwards and became the de facto incident commander even after he came back. Um, and so <clears throat> that led to my substantive involvement for about six months in this emergency response uh, coordinated through FEMA, coordinated through um, the declaration on the state of emergency, the declaration by President Biden, and brought with it a significant amount of resources. The challenge was <clears throat> the sargassum buildup and its subsequent breakdown clogged the intakes for the water production plant. Not only did it clog the intakes, what it did, it increased the frequency of cleaning of the filters used in the reverse osmosis plant. So they were taking in water and that was fine, but because of the particulate matter from the degradation of the sargassum pieces, the cleaning frequency, the shutdown frequency of the plant led to a reduction in water production for the 13,000 customers of the distribution system <clears throat> and pushed us, I wouldn't say critically, but uncomfortably into about four days worth of water supply. The plant is able to produce roughly about 3 million gallons a day and we were down to one and a half. So we were scraping on margins. So whilst we, we have some storage facilities across the island of St. Croix, and these were somewhere around 50, 50% 50 um, because of the, the lowered production, the reduction in production of water, we were not able to push the resources, <clears throat> push water to um, these storage facilities in an appropriate or timely manner, um, and which led to anxiety on part of the territory, and, and rightly so. The response involved our federal partners, FEMA, 
National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration who provided um, uh, forecasting capabilities to us, uh, Brad Bengio um, in particular. And of course, our partners in Puerto Rico played a, a, an important role. Um, in fact, we were sent, I would say, six emergency tanks of potable water for distribution if needed. Uh, logistically, we also retained, we also got from Puerto Rico a shipments of bottled water in case the plant went down indefinitely and there were any other challenges. Um, throughout this process as well, we also had to define future courses of action. What do we need to prevent this happening in the future? In the picture, you can see uh, some turbidity barriers. These were uh, immediate and, and, and somewhat um, reactive response to protecting the water inlet. Unfortunately, much of this was after the fact. You can see the shoreline inundated with sargassum and the brown coloration expanding seaward from the shoreline. Um, in the picture on the left, you may actually see a, a large excavator with a boom, a, a boom extension reaching out to remove um, sargassum material from the shoreline. So we eventually contracted uh, a local company who cleaned that entire shoreline um, with our permission and under supervision from the Division of Fish and Wildlife of the material there in order to allow the degradation of the material to reduce. The other challenge that we have as a small island is where to put sargassum. And I looked, the reason I titled the topic environmental and public health is this was a public health challenge, but environmentally, uh, for those of you who are looking closely, this entire area is actually covered in rich native seagrass beds. And so the, the decomposition of the material, the deposition of the material on healthy seagrass beds has also led to a degradation of seagrass ecosystems. Um, we've also documented its impact on nearshore coral resources where it has actually wiped out cervical acropora service cervicornis beds which are on the ESA listed uh, species list um, so we're having the sargassum influx and the sargassum challenges having both an impact both on our public health systems and on our environmental systems both of which support our econ economic systems um, next slide please uh, this is just a, a Christian said harbor. This is a, a, a view of that influx a few days after it came in. Um, and this was particularly unusual. Uh, this area does not necessarily have um, a larger influx. We do get mats breaking off, but this was a, a, a significant challenge for us. In part because this area is also a, a natural harbor bound by what is called long reef. And so once it gets in, it can't get out. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we appreciated was, and, and, and Patricia is on, was a panelist on the previous topic, um, is Caracus's floating algal index, which we utilized um to help us do some predictive um some predictive monitoring of where and and how we expected some large influxes and the potential for impacts to us um it it, it has proved very useful and is continuing to prove useful so i want to say publicly thank you to caracus for this tool um, as we get them, we are also sending them out to our local emergency management agency and the local hotel and tourism association for them to prepare for these large influxes. This challenge is being met in a number of ways. Um, 
unfortunately not always are the preferred methodologies. The removal by manual means of large volumes of sargassum is just impractical. Um, we have gotten complaints from the community about the utilization of heavy equipment on beaches to remove it. Uh, but to be frank, as a as a as a people manager, because I don't manage resources, uh, let, let me say that first and foremost, I manage people who affect resources. The challenge is when you have large volumes of this material coming up on the beaches, it is an almost insurmountable task to use manual labor to do it. Also, you're putting at risk uh, these persons who are working in there, um, especially when it starts to degrade. So we've had some challenges in managing how we remove it from beaches. It is largely to the skills and the resources provided by the large corporate entities such as the hotels um, with our guidance. So we have also developed a guidance document uh, detailing when and how large materials can be can be used. I mean, large equipment can be used. Here is a picture of the Ritz Carlton, I believe, on the eastern end of St. Thomas. Um, thankfully to our NOAA partners, NOAA Office of Coastal Management, we were able to reprogram <clears throat> a, a small pot of funding at the end of last year into earlier this year to develop not a management plan, but a blueprint of how we need to tackle this problem, which was completed earlier this year and which will serve as a uh, future guidance for how we tackle this problem. It is multifaceted and I'm sure uh, Ms. Ibanks will speak to the, the challenges in Jamaica as well. It is a multifaceted problem that unfortunately our communities usually look to the government to solve and this is one problem a government alone cannot solve. We need the science, we need the entrepreneurs, <clears throat> we need the engineers um we need our tourism community as well as we need our waste management community to tackle um i started to mention the fact that we do not have large areas to actually store this material we've also learned that its use in agricultural purposes has to be monitored carefully uh, because of high arsenic levels and other and, and possibly other things so we know that some jurisdictions are using it um it has to be washed and cleaned those resources again from a from a public health and water perspective conservation of water on small islands that have limited freshwater resources washing large amounts of sargassum is impractical and probably inappropriate um so I will leave it at that. I, I wanted to be brief. I wanted to bring out the questions to come out in the discussion mostly, and I'll and I'll try to do my best to respond to as accurately as possible to all those questions. So thank you very much, Emily, and 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 no Caribbean group. Thank you, Marlon, for that great presentation. Certainly, a, a huge challenge, and a multidisciplinary team is needed to help solve some of these issues. And I'd just like to remind all of our participants that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will get to them after all of the speakers during our discussion panel. Now I will introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jessica Castro Estevez. She is a research professor and the head of the Environment Research Laboratory at the Federico uh, Henriquez and our Vala University in the Dominican Republic. Apologies for my butchering of that pronunciation. She has a master's degree and a PhD in biological engineering from Utah State University. Her research is focused on the use of res residual aquatic species biomass, such as microalgae, water hyacinth, and sargassum on the production of biofuels. And she is currently the principal investigator of a nationally funded project on the use of sargassum biomass for the extraction of bioactive compounds and biofuel production. And Jessica is going to talk to us today about four first steps towards sustainable management of sargassum in the 
Dominican Republic. And over to you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Emily, for the introduction. And thank you, thanks to NOAA for the Caribbean for inviting me in to this annual partner meeting. I'm very happy to be with you all. So uh, in this next 15 minutes, I will be talking to you about the practices that we have in the Dominican Republic in order to manage sargassum. And these are only first steps since we actually, um, are, we do not have a sustainable management plan in place, but um, I will show you what we do and what are the plans for the future. Next. Please. <laughs> yes, it's good to know that in our case, the sargassum um, it has been affected um, our beaches. And for us as a country that is mainly based on an economy that depends on tourism, this is really harsh. Um, you can see here the images of what we offer to the tourists. We offer beaches that are very clean, uh, blue water, white sand, and um, actually, as I mentioned before, our economy depends on, on tourism. As we can see here, according to the Central Bank of the Dominican Republic, more than 30% of the economy growth was due to tourism in 2022. Also, we had in the same year, more than 8.5 million tourists that visit the country. And, and yeah, like we are an island. As, as, as well as the other islands that have been affected by sargassum in the Caribbean. So most of our um, beauty and nature comes from, from the coastal areas. We have 3,347 kilometers of beautiful beaches and reefs that are currently affected by sargassum. Next, please. And here you, you see the same images. So these are the same places that I showed you in the previous slide. It's just that in this case, we, we have beaches that now to a certain degree have been affected by sargassum, like San Rafael in Barahona, Barahona Beach from. These ones are in the southwest of the country, which is not that affected by sargassum as compared to the southeast and the east coast of the country. But because of this, and we all know that this phenomenon is attributed to climate change, we see that it's hard for us to, to keep track of, of having tourists come into our country and enjoying what we know as, as the beautiful beaches that we generally have. Next. And, and the problem here with sargassum is not only about the economy that is affected. We, we heard Martin talking about how it also might affect, previous, please. <laughs> How, it can, how can it affect um, even the power plants? So we have the same issue that they have with the WAPA power plant. We have the same problem with Punta Catalina, which is our power plant that was closed due to sargassum influence, sargassum blooms that affected the operations that they had. So in also, this is related to the health of the people that live surrounding these dishes. Uh, because we know that the stranded sargassum Gasson has issues not only for the biodiversity, but also for the people that live in the areas for the fishermen, because of the hydrogen sulfide and ammonia that are generated in during the decomposition of of this biomass. So this is this is an important issue issue for us. Next, and, and here we can see a map that was. Um, suministered by the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources in our country in 2018. As you can see, there are a small green points or triangles that show the places in which we had had sargassum arrivals. And, and as you can see, in that year, the South was predominantly affected by it, as, as I showed you in the previous slides and pictures, and the North is not that that affected with only has the ocean or ocean, Atlantic Ocean in comparison with the Caribbean Sea. So we see that we have a specific areas which actually are very touristic areas that are affected by sargassum. Next. And, and here we also have uh, more data or statistics regarding um, the sargassum influences depending on the provinces. We have here from the year 2015 to 2018 
and, and we can see how provinces like La Alta Gracia, which is the one that actually has Punta Cana, which is very well known, um, La, La Romana is not that affected, at least in that year, but this year we have, um, like we have a forecast of receiving at least three million tons of sargassum for in the country. So we can see the La Alta Gracia, generally, um, San Pedro de Macorís and Barahona, Pedernales are provinces that are affected by, by sargassum. So, but in general, we have 15 points that affect 15 provinces of the country. So we're talking about a very large um, um, coastline that is being affected by the influences. Next. So what are we doing regarding this? Where well, our country has taken some measures. The first one was in 2015 regarding creating um, the Sargasso National Committee. And this committee was formed by public authorities like the ministers of environment, tourism, public works, the presidency, and representatives of tourism companies. So this, this first initiative to, to have set a committee that will be in charge of creating or making decisions regarding sargassum and also making policies regarding it was actually not very active from that time now to now. But then um, the National Sargassum Board was created this year, early this year by the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. And, and the point is to gather uh, stakeholders from private and public sector academia, that includes me, of course, uh, the on, on ONGs and cooperation agencies <clears throat> in order to create a national sargassum sustainable management plan, which is, is gonna be based on the meetings that we already had. So now we're in the stage in which this ministry is, is putting together these ideas that were set in the meetings by all these stakeholders and create a plan, a sustainable management plan for sargassum influences. Next. And as part of the, of the meetings and the board that we had, um, we had different groups that were classified in the monitoring and prediction, contention, removal, and disposal, which was another group, valorization and use, research and development, and regional cooperation. So these are important steps and there are part of the management of sargassum that need to be taken into account in order to have a sustainable management plan for, for sargassum. Next. Let's go, let's gonna see each one of them, what we're doing right now with them. So that way we have like an idea of where we are as a country in the Dominican Republic regarding the management of sargassum. So first we have monitoring and prediction. In our case, as a country, we use three main tools that two of them are from the United States and one of them is from Europe, which help us with the monitor. The first one is the satellite-based sargassum watch system, which was developed by the Optical Oceanographic Laboratory of the University of South Florida. You can see here that we have information that is related to the floating algae density that gives you an idea of what, um, how you've been affected by it, and you can monitor uh, weekly the progress of, of the sargassum. We can see that the image that I'm showing right now is from, from recent week, is from the 12th to the 18th of June of this year. And this is free, which is very helpful for us in, in terms of decision making. Next. Also, we are using, well, your own NOAA Experimental Weekly National Inundation Report, which um, actually give us information regarding the coastal reef levels, if it's high, medium, low. And you can see here that the Dominican Republic, which is labeled as Punta Cana, <laughs> maybe because it's a touristic spot that everybody knows, right? Um, we can see that the south and the east is, is has high risk. And then at uh, the north part of the of the island has a low uh, risk of of having the sargassum inundation. So this is report also is is free and is very useful 
and we're very thankful for you guys having it available for everyone. And we use it in the Dominican Republic as well. Next. So, and then the last one is one that actually has been adequated by the National Maritime Affairs Authority, NMR, of the Dominican Republic. It's a SAM tool, Sargasso Monitoring, that is based on the forecast from Marine Copernicus Services. And basically, the idea is that NMR decided to acquire this tool. Actually, this one is no, is no free, and they have it in the website of Anamar. So anytime that uh, Dominicans want to go and see how things are, they can just easily go to Anamar and you will find uh, weekly reports. Um, well, actually five day reports. We see that the one that is is in the slide is from June 15 to June 12, 20. And, and the tails that are showing the different points that you can see on the map represent the trajectory that is predicted to have the sargassum and the colors, uh, how far they are from the coast. So this is very useful for Anamar since they are in charge of making that first step of telling what's going to happen regarding the sargassum, what is going and so forth. Next. So, so after Anamar used these tools, what they do is that they have a daily review of their arrival forecasts and they socialize the findings with the Control Intelligence Center of the Dominican Navy to see if intervention is needed. So if intervention is needed, they will have to talk to the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources because that's the institution that has the authority for decision-making based on action protocols on sargassum. And also, this type of information, it helps a lot for um, informing the hotels because they also ask for this type of input from Anamar. Um, they, what is going to happen? What is the forecast? And the fishing sector also will get this information so that way they can decide what to do. Monitoring and prediction is an important step because we cannot take action unless we know what is happening and when it's happening and where it's happening. So this is this is what we're doing right now regarding monitoring and prediction. Next. When it comes to contention, this is an activity that mainly is conducted by the private sector. And by this, I mean hotels. So you, we are a touristic country, so we have a, a lot of hotel change. They invest money when it comes to having this barrier place in, put into place because they're very expensive. So, in the case of our country, what they have done is that, okay, we have barriers. These barriers are the ones that are being uh, financially acquired by hotels. So it's a private uh, in, it's a private thing. So they, they made it for the hotels and they only are covering those coastal areas that affected their hotels. So what happened was that in 2020, in November, the government decided to open a fund for the mitigation and management of sargassum and that that type of fund will have almost 12 million dollars uh, to start with and it will be um, money that will be put between the ministry of tourism which is the government and hotel sector coordinated by the national association of hotels and restaurants of the dominican republic as on our list. the thing is that this is still going on um, I believe not all the money has been put where it has to, but at least the government did the part of putting the 50% of that amount into the correct account. And now also it's been a plan related to this, which is to, to obtain a contract on the supply and installation of containment collection and disposal system for Sargassen in 45.4 kilometers of selected costed coasts of Verón, Punta Cana, municipal district. That district is very touristic, is, is very important, is where Punta Cana is, and also Bávaro. Next. So one, once we have the contention, which is very relevant for hotels, because hotels, they don't want the sargassum to reach the beach, 
Also, even for health, is good because we don't have the sargassum being decomposed on, on the beach. And that way, the emissions that are generated in the decomposition process won't be affecting fishermen and people surrounding the area. So once we have that contention, then the hotels, they also have the private sector companies that work um, for this, right, for the removal process. They have um, companies like Alginova, which will be in charge or are in charge of collecting the sargassum with machinery. And in this case, we're talking about machineries that, that operates um, on water. And as you can see, this is the image and this machinery is heavy. So it's in charge of collecting the sargassum that has been contained with the barriers. Next, please. So, but sometimes the contention is not enough to get all the sargassum out of the beach. So sometimes there's some, some of some of these biomass can be found in between the beach and the barriers. So for in these cases, companies like SOS Carbon are contracted because they will be collecting the sargassum before it reaches the beach and they will be using boats, as you can see here. And also they use the collaboration of fishermen, which is really good because sometimes fishermen in the sargassum season, they, they're not able to fish properly. And this way they are being integrated into this adaptation measure, which is, of course, collecting sargassum. Next. So in the case that the sargassum reaches the beach, as we can see here, there's some machinery that has been acquired also by some hotels. And in this case, we have the image here of the Scarbat Beach Trotters uh, machinery. So Beach Trotter developed this machinery that is a machinery that won't be affecting the sand. They, they won't be eroding the, the beach because it collected the sargassum. But actually, while it collected it, it made some sieving that at the end only keeps sargassum inside the machine and then and the, the sand will be put back into place. Next. Now, let's talk about the public sector. So when we, those things that I show you are related to hotels, how they manage it. So they got money, they, they care about the beaches because that's their business. So when it comes to the public sector, the government, it's a little bit hard for the government, the removal and the disposal. So right now, we don't count with that technology that we see that the hotels use. No, in our case, for instance, in the case that um, the beaches have a little bit of sargassum, not enough to, to use a machine, what is done is that the Ministry of Tourism, for instance, have a, a staff that will be collecting sargassum manually, using manual tools. So not a lot of erosion will be found there, little erosion, it will be good, they collect it, and then the municipalities will be taking it to dump sites. And that's in the case of quantities of sargassum that are managed uh, by people like, you know, with bags and easily managed by them and easily managed by the municipalities. Next. However, when it comes to quantities that are higher, in this case, things get a little bit complicated, machinery come into place and machinery that will erode the beaches that, uh, you know, bad practice is sometimes used, as you can see in the, in the pictures, and machinery will be, taking sargassum, construction machinery, taking the sargassum, collecting it, and also excavation will take place in situ because uh, municipalities, they don't want to manage so much sargassum for the municipalities is, is like a special type of waste. It's hard for them to do it. There are no policies put into place so that way it happens correctly. So what is done as an emergency action is just to to excavate the pit and to put the, the, the sargassum there and then cover it with sand. In the case of the hotels, they will send it to dump sites and, and sometimes 
they might do the same thing. So there is not actually like, uh, because there is not a plan in which the government is, is, is working necessarily uh, with the hotels and make sure that policies that are put in place will work. Um, this, this is now something hard to find. Next. So, so what will happen? The problem here, as mentioned, as Marlon mentioned, is where to put sargassum. It's, it's hard to to find a way to put sargassum in a place that in which it's not going to be harming the environment. So, if we put it in dump sites or even in landfills, which are you know engineered landfills, it will be better. But at the same time, you hear we're talking about an organic material. So ideally, you shouldn't be doing that. Ideally, you should try to get some options what to do with it because you will be, um, of course, producing a lot of methane and um, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide in these places like the dump sites and the, and also the, the landfill. So uh, because of that, valorization is very special, important for this because if we are able to make products that have a value and if we can sell them at least we can mitigate the costs that are related to managing sarcasm because it's, it's, it's costly we have to admit it and uh, in this case we had fundacion grupo punta cana which has been very very active in getting together with academia try to find research uh, done related to the use of sarcasm for instance, in the picture of the, of the left, we can see that here we have sargassum um, put in place with um, some biodigesters. This is an experimental area. I had the opportunity to, to work on this project. And, and basically, we're doing here co-digestion of sargassum and food waste. You know that food waste is another problem in touristic places where you have all-inclusive because people sometimes eat, they take too much food, that they cannot eat and they do have these residues and it's not as smart to send it to a dump site to generate greenhouse gases so in this case the idea is to combine these two type of residues which are organic and to produce biomethane um, and in the future of course even electricity we combine heat and power technologies so this is an experiment that was taken into place in 2021 but also we have companies that are doing the same. Like we have SOS Carbon, which exports sargassum to a, to a cosmetic company. The company is called Origin by Ocean. So they do that. At least it, it, you are doing something with the sargassum that you collect uh, on, the, on the sea. Also, um, Punta Cana Foundation is also doing some trials on composting sargassum because that way also they will find alternatives for, for the sargassum to to get some value and so that way they can sell it. Uh, and the same thing is is doing Alginova. Alginova is doing some composting experiments, biodegradable plates also they have been developed uh, from the sargassum that they collect. Next. So this is important, but also we need to do more research and development. That's something that needs to, to be considering. And so far our country, through the Minister of Higher Education, has been supporting some research projects. And so the funds are around 0 0.5 or half a million to 0 0.75 million dollars uh, annually uh, in projects that are related to sarcasm. And also this year, the president uh, made an announcement in, in which he will also set a million, extra million dollars for the financing and support of, of research on sargassum. E and the academia, right? I, I am part of, of course of the academia too. So the academia, we have come together as universities and say, hey, this problem requires us to work together too. Like why not having a network? So we have the academic sargassum network that have nine universities as part of it. We have UNEPEC, INTEC, UAS, UFEC, where I'm from. Uh, Pucamayma, Unibe, Unisa, and Ucatesi. So far, we're nine universities. Next. So, 
we we as as a network that we are we have been working on different topics we have come together like depending on the lines of of research lines of each university we have come together so that way we work in projects together and we're stronger so we have covered uh, we have proposals and we have projects on impact on diversity in fisheries social impact of sargassum monitoring prediction characterization storage uh, biogas production, composite material, activated carbon by fertilizers and bioactive compounds. Next. And uh, of course, regional cooperation is really important uh, as part of, of the cooperation that we believe that needs to, to take place in the region. And the European Union and the Minister of, of, of uh, International Affairs um, and the Minister of um, environment come together, came together recently, and we put together a regional conference on sargassum, wider Caribbean and European Union, and turning sargassum into an opportunity that happened the 15th of June last Thursday. And the idea is that through regional cooperation, we should be able to transfer, to have the transferring of technology and knowledge in the area, in the region that is affected by sargassum, create regional policies, coordinate actions for mitigation between the countries. Also, we should get funding from developed countries in order to get a good adaptation program in each of these countries that are affected. Next. Well, so this that I present to you was based on a report that was put together by Luis Torren Ivescus as part of is work for the European Union and also with uh, interviews and direct and indirect contact with the peoples that you see on the on the right and uh, from the Minister of uh, Environment, Anamar, Grupo Punta Cana, Genova, SOS Carbon, the Minister of Higher Education and different universities. Next. Thank you so much. If you have questions, um, I'll be very happy to, to answer them in the discussion session. And also, this is my contact information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that comprehensive presentation on what the Dominican Republic is doing for sargassum and the many challenges that are faced by not just Dominican Republic, but certainly other areas in the Caribbean. We're going to turn now to our last speaker who is going to talk to us about challenges in Jamaica, Jodiel A. Banks. She is the technical coordinator for Beaches Management Program at the National Environment and Planning Agency in Jamaica. In this capacity, she has responsibility for the institutional coordination of beaches in Jamaica, including the agency's monitoring and response to sargassum influxes. And I will turn it over now to Jody L, who will be telling us about sargassum management in Jamaica and their national response strategy. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Emily would have alluded to or pointed out, my presentation is on sargassum management in Jamaica and national response. And I am working with the National Environment and Planning Agency. Regarding, next slide, please. Regarding my presentation this morning, I will be taking you through the history of sargassum in Jamaica, the government's development of the national response strategy, and the various responses under the strategy, including information exchange and mobilization, communication, monitoring and tracking, shoreline cleanup, and resource assessment and research. Next slide, please. As it pertains to the history of sargassum in Jamaica, Jamaica had their first major influx in 2015. And at that time, majority of the beaches were inundated with sargassum. So right around the island, we were experiencing sargassum and the impacts that the other islands would have been experiencing, the loss of recreational use, the, the smell brought on by the decomposing sargassum was a challenge for us, the fisher folks, um, being impacted by their lines being entangled and the motors also being entangled. So on screen is a picture of Winifred Beach in Portland. Portland is in the southeast of the island. And what we have been finding is that Portland, 
because of its location and the currents around Jamaica is particularly affected whenever sargassum comes onto the island. Next picture, please. The next picture is from Kingston, which is on the southern coastline of the island. And this picture here dates in 2014. So this is when sargassum had just started to arrive on the island. And the last picture shows Negril, which is on the opposite end of the island from these two beaches. Negril is on the western end of the island and is one of our Jamaica's major tourism destinations. So in 2015, this industry was particularly affected. Next slide, please. What the government of Jamaica sought to do in 2015 when the first major influx occurred was to develop a national response strategy, the Sargassum Threat. It was a document produced through interagency collaboration, including my agency, the National Environment and Planning Agency, the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, and the National Solid Waste Management Authority. And it sought to define measures for responding to the accumulation of sargassum on our shores. At that time, Jamaica would have been um, familiar with the experiences of the other islands, starting from their uh, um, impacts back in 2011 and 2013. But this was still new to us here in 2015, and we went into response mode. Now the document would have covered the strategies such as public sensitization, community mobilization, shoreline cleanup, and product development. So I will now go into these various areas. Next slide, please. So the first response strategy, information exchange and mobilization of local communities and group. Uh, through this strategy, the document titled the General Guidelines for the Manual Removal of Sargassum from Shorelines was developed. And the document promotes the manual removal of sargassum from shorelines. So uh, it, uh, it's, it, 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 give, um, it basically states that sargassum, as the first point of response, should be raked up and manual measures used. So it describes not using mechanical means in the first instance. It also speaks to the stockpiling, how sargassum should be stockpiled once it's raked up from the foreshore. And this is to be done on the back shore or a grassy area on the beach, turned, turned over time to promote drying out and the loosening of sand. And it also describes that the sand should be brought back to the beach where it can be. Um, and the other component of the guidelines speak to the disposal of sargassum. Uh, my colleague Pryor would have gone into the proper ways to do it, but as, as per the guidelines here, we encourage where possible burial of the sargassum takes place on the site, on the back shore of the beach or land adjoining, or if there's an area offshore that it can be transported to, then this can be considered once the requisite approvals are in place. This guideline is published widely in newspapers, on NEPA's website and social media, and it would have been distributed in 2015 through our various networks to hoteliers and other community groups. Next slide, please. So regarding communication, as mentioned before, there are regular advertisements and information disseminated to the public. So on screen is two advisories that were recently published by NEPO. Uh, on the left is an advisory that was run on social media, including our social media and paid advertisement in the, on this social media page of one of the major newspaper outlets in Jamaica. And on the right is an ad that was also placed in the published newspaper. And it details the advisory that, you know, we're ex which may be experiencing a large influx, be be wary or be warned that sargassum may be coming in in large masses, as well as the advisory as to what to do. I should point out that the guideline it speaks to also, it informs stakeholders that if it is that the removal of sargassum on their beaches is too much for manual removal, a permission, explicit written permission is needed from the National Environment and Planning Agency to remove sargassum. And then that approval would 
detail the best practices to protect the beach resources. Next slide, please. Um, so here on screen is a dedicated page on the National Environment and Planning Agency's website regarding sargassum, uh, what it is, how to respond to it. So basically the measures for removing it and for the public to, you know, know what it is because there are some persons out there who still are not sure what sargassum is. They just see this brown seaweed, but they don't have all the information. And this, this information was adopted from the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute. Next slide, please. Regarding monitoring and tracking, there is continuous monitoring of public bathing beaches across Jamaica, and this has been ongoing since 2018. So when Sargassum had first arrived in 2015, there was tracking, but in terms of the agency, making it a part of the agency's program of work, this has been ongoing since 2018. And what happens is that the sites are visited and we record a positive influx of sargassum or a negative influx of sargassum. A positive influx is when the height of the stockpile reaches one meter or exceeds one meter and then that's recorded as a positive influx. Approximately 27 beaches are visited each quarter. We have 82 public bathing beaches, so we have to select where we go. Uh, we have since 2021 determined 10 index sites to visit. So those 10, 10 index sites are visited every quarter and why we have chosen those sites is because we had seen a trend where whenever Sargassum was on the island, those sites had been inundated. So it would be a good marker to know if there's the seaweed present. Uh, the data is collected using the RGIS Survey 123 platform under a Government of Jamaica Enterprise License Agreement. And from the data, the National Environment and Planning Agency prepares an annual report on the status and trends of sargassum across the island. Next slide, please. So the other response, back, one slide back, please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so our next component of our monitoring and tracking, um, Jessica would have gone into, would have given some background as to this. So the agency also uses the satellite tracking system available from this University of South Florida. And that is something that we use to predict uh, what's next, what's next on the horizon and the status uh, of what's happening in Jamaica. So based on the predictions, we're able to send out the advisories and activate the appropriate response mechanisms at that point. Next slide, please. So the other response strategy is shoreline cleanup. Um, the picture on screen, uh, as I would have spoken about before, is the manual cleanup. They're using rakes to remove the sargassum from the shoreline and a little bit more information about the shoreline cleanup is that when beaches when certain beaches become overwhelmed with sargassum the agency activates a, a response a sargassum response and it involves a multi-agency approach um as marlon would have said you know uh, stakeholders look to the government to to to, to respond to the sargassum on the shores so we have coordinated a multi-agency response and priority is given to public beaches, beaches close to residents, hotel beaches. And it's evident why these beaches would have, you know, been prioritized because of the socioeconomic impacts and of course the environmental impacts. So funding is provided for cleanup by the Tourism Enhancement Fund and a response is triggered at the local level, at the local municipal level, and then the local municipal level would activate the various community groups to carry out the removal of sargassum. At next two pictures, please. Um, so manual cleanup is not always possible. So in those instances, we have to employ maybe a front end loader to remove the sargassum. And the picture on the immediate right shows the stockpiling of the sargassum on the back shore, on the grass area adjacent to the beach, where the material is then turned and the sand be encouraged to loosen and, and drying is facilitated. 
Next, please. On screen here is a snippet from a newspaper article that was published in the Jamaica Gleaner in 2021, and it details the cleanup response that was activated by the National Environment and Planning Agency. And what had triggered that was a fish kill, a fish kill in St. Catherine on the southern coastline of the island. And the investigation revealed that the fish kill was as a result of oxygen, oxygen depletion in the water as a result of the rotting or decomposition of the sargassum. And therefore, it had to be corrected by removing the sargassum from the water. Um, just to point out, this, this location here is one of our index sites, but it hosts two index sites that I would have mentioned for continuous monitoring because once again, this is an area where we tend to see sargassum accumulated whenever the island is particularly affected. Next, please. Um, on screen, there are two methodologies for mechanical cleanup. They were investigated by the agency some time back. We have the Saga boat and a trailer system to, have, to make collection at sea possible, and the surf rake for the efficient removal of sargassum from the beach. Um, at that time, the agency had engaged local stakeholders who had identified what indicated that interest. Um, one of the, my prior colleagues would have mentioned also using fisher folks because of the loss of livelihood at that time, and you know to be able to I guess boost their earnings, they would have switched from fishing to sargassum because of the circumstances. Um, so at that time we would have engaged them. However, we were not able to utilize these methods due to cost restraints, and it was recognized that further research would have been necessary on the use of sargassum. So that takes us into our fourth and last response mechanism for sargassum management as a national response in Jamaica. Next slide, please. Back in 2018, NEPO, National Environment and Planning Agency, had requested partnership, partnership for research. And the University of the West Indies, through the Faculty of Science and Technology, responded favorably. And a memorandum, memorandum of understanding was entered into. And a sargassum group titled Exploring the Potential Commercial, commercial Uses of Sargassum was established. And the group sought to determine the techniques for collecting and utilizing sargassum, as well as to determine any potential uses as a fertilizer for agricultural, crop, agricultural crops and mangrove seedlings. Next slide, please. The major findings from that project were categorized into three groups. They had the high volume, low value, high volume, medium value, and low volume, high value. And what was found is that for high volume, low value use of sargassum, uh, it could, the material, the seaweed could be used for anaerobic digestion, production of methane and amelioration. And for high volume, medium value, it could be used as texturizing agents in a myriad of industrial applications, including in the food industry. And for low volume, high value, it could be potentially used in the produ production of pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. Um, that research is still ongoing. Our next research uh, that I would want to highlight is that done by the International Center for, Mer for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences, which is also at UEMUNA. And what was found is that for sargassum in Jamaica, the average concentration of arsenic is 60 parts per meter or 60 milligram per kg. And as we all know, the concentration and the levels of arsenic in sargassum is a major concern regarding its use. And it has basically impacted the potential use in agriculture and other purpose. So there has to be ways to reduce the arsenic level before we can explore some of the other uses. The third study I want to highlight is also associated with the UEMONA, and that's the work done by the MONA Geoinformatics Institute, MGI. Uh, the institute has created a sargassum distribution map. They would have benefited from our monitoring, so the annual reports are shared with the MGI, with the institute, 
And they've also been tasked with creating a predictive model for the landing of Sargasso Maroon, the island. Currently, the MGI is exploring a project titled The Implementation of a Sargasso Transformation Pilot System for Jamaica's Vulnerable Sector Pilot Project. And their partners are AgriShare, SOS Carbon, the Tourism Enhancement Fund, which is an agency in, of government in Jamaica. As for the National Environment and Planning Agency, we have committed technical expertise and assistance. Um, and this brings us to the end of my presentation. I thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much. And so we're going to ask all of the panelists now to, to turn on the camera for a few questions. One thing I'll note is any questions that were for NOAA will be answered by the NOAA and the Caribbean group after this webinar. But we'll turn now to our presenters for, for a few questions. One question that came up was for your islands, what is the most um, or prominent research gap that you are seeing right now in terms of informing your response? Uh, Marlon? So I'll be I'll be I'll be honest. The other two, Jessica and Joriel, uh, mentioned disposal. Um, the challenge with the Virgin Islands is that we have a finite amount of space. <laughs> we also have some landfills that are at the end of their life cycle. And with, a, and with no more space to actually institute any new landfills. Um, for those of you who are aware, we have what is called a consent decree by the Department of Justice. And in fact, our landfills were supposed to have been closed from 2016. So they're teetering on the end right now. So we have no space um, currently in which to remove, store, uh, sargassum debris so that's a big challenge and a gap in terms of we need the type of research to figure out what to do with large volumes um you know whether it is we are going to as jessica mentioned in the dominican republic whether we're going to put up 45 kilometers of of booms and try to pull it back out to sea um which you know is costly she she, she mentioned 11 million dollars I'm sure it's costing some more. That was only seed money. I'm sure it's costing a lot more. And we've seen that here as well. So I think one of the largest gaps is figuring out what to do with large volume, large volumes. Uh, Jody L mentioned, you know, large volumes, high value, medium value, etc. We we need that research and not necessarily in our islands. If you can do it and we can copy it, we'll gladly do that. Yes, okay. Yes, I believe that more than the research gap, what we might have is a problem with the transition between research and development. Maybe the investment of the uh, companies or investors to decide, okay, yeah, let's let's jump into this. And maybe the problem is that sometimes they might doubt, they say, okay, Sargassum started striding like, you know, in our islands in 2011. They might fear that then it's going to come a point in which it's not going to be um, having blooms in our islands and maybe that has stopped them but i believe that that will be the only thing i think that a lot of research has been done for instance judy even presented some uh, preliminary results regarding uh, valorization but we need investors to say okay let's take this that academia has developed and let's convert it into companies let's use this sargassum for these purposes. Great, thank you. Those those sound like both very, very big challenges, a lot of material, not a lot of space, and then how to get people to invest and have a sustainable market for that. Um, another question we had was in terms of when they do bury some of the sargassum, are you having issues with some of the arsenic leaching into the coastal systems? I'll, I'll jump in again. Um, unknown is the word okay. I'd use. <laughs> unknown. Yeah. Um, 
So in the territory, the Solid Waste Management Agency, at the height of the sargassum influx season, only accepts sargassum twice weekly. And they have designated in the landfill a specific area. Now, in the territory, what is done is soil coverage. So sargassum comes in or green waste, it's mixed with green waste, it's covered. There's also been a challenge with flammability issues. When it's dry, mm. uh, it is also prone to flammability. So uh, in one instance, the, the landfill on St. Croix, in fact, covers with a proprietary <clears throat> uh, fire retardant um, in, in order to prevent uh, the, the, the potential for, for a fire. But I would say unknown. Um, as far as I know, we're not collecting any current data on impacts to groundwater or these the coastal areas of, of arsenic leachate. Great, thank you. I wasn't aware that they were covering some of it with fire retardant, so that might also be a you know contamination issue. So thanks for bringing that up for our attention. Another question we had was when they're doing the manual removal from the beaches. Have there been studies on how that is impacting erosion? I'll let, I'll let the ladies go. In terms of studies for the manual removal, that has not been done, but based on the methodology that we promote, it would have a uh, minimum impact on erosion but as far for the relationship between sargassum and erosion we do believe it exists for example there is a particular site um the same one with the fish kill in saint catherine which is where the agency had conducted numerous iccd international coastal cleanup day activities and between the time when the sargassum started to come and when the sargassum was cleared, we would have visually observed a decrease in beach width and other um, other signs of beach erosion. Since then, that site has been added to our beach erosion network, and there has been there has been erosion. Uh, that that we only have like four years of data, but we're seeing erosion. Um, of course, we would not have the methodology to determine how much of it is as a result of sargassum, but we had observed the loss of beach width since the time sargassum has started, since sargassum has started to arrive on that shoreline. Great, thank you. It does sound like there's a you know a lot of research that needs, still needs to be done in terms of the the impact of sargassum. Um, so, so to, to wrap up, I wanted to ask the panelists if you have any any suggestions on what could be done in terms of regional cooperation to help with information sharing or other aspects of sargassum management. Um, Jessica? Well, regarding cooperation, I believe that um, it should start by the authorities and uh, maybe they coming together to um, to meeting and deciding on policy that might be um, able to create the dynamic of collaboration. Because we have as researchers, for instance, there's some, some networks, including one that was uh, opened by the Florida International University. And, you know, we collaborate, researchers will share the papers and everything. So at this level, that's fine. And also I see that some companies like SOS Carbon is collaborating with people from Jamaica and so forth. But I believe that at a higher level, it has to come uh, the collaboration incentive. So that way the rest of, of the stakeholders can actually be put into action. I believe policies that might be giving incentive to collaboration, maybe between the different countries, will help, uh, for instance, private sectors to come together, um, also academia to come together. And in that way, these incentives are, are put in place and this is done by authorities, public authorities, then I believe then that might help uh, to achieve the, the goal of regional collaboration. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, as you noted, we have seen the research com community coming together and collaborating, but trying to go to the next step again, public authorities together really will, will be important for, for action. Uh, Marlon and Jodiel, do you have anything to, to add on that point? Jodiel, you can go first. Um, I would have to put some more thought into it because yes, it was pretty comprehensive. So Marlon, you can go ahead. Thank you. So I think, you know, I think we have, we have started a good network, the United Nations Environment Program and um, the work that was done out of CERMES in Barbados by Oxenford and I think Glasgow, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, is good work you know sargadapt is another group that is working on regional collaboration so i think we have the beginning and a foundation for sharing information uh, i i'll agree with jessica the private sector is by far one of the more important groups that need to actually form the collaboration so we have academia we have governmental agencies who are collaborating but I believe the private sector is not as integrated within the Caribbean because the valorization of the pro of this material is going to be the important piece. If we don't get entrepreneurs thinking, how can the Caribbean supply sargassum products to the world? <laughs> this is where it is, to the global market. Uh, because again, in in, in, in our own jurisdictions, if we start to produce cosmetics and food, our communities are, in some cases, economically challenged. We're not going to be spending money on cosmetics produced from sargassum. It is going to be led by the demographics that can afford it. Those demographics are in highly developed countries, usually outside of the region. So this is where the, the local business community entrepreneurs need to go you know we have a local company in saint lucia algal buyer organics who is producing who has a proprietary brand of fertilizer that they have produced who are trying to build a bigger footprint within the, the regional community um you know i think we need to maybe listen more to them and encourage them provide more seed money so that they can expand not just in saint lucia but across expand the technology across the, the region and utilize large volumes so i think that's one that's one area that we need to uh encourage is that local private entrepreneurial community to actually collaborate more because those ideas you know rather than being proprietary and shielding your information we need to get it out here that hey this is a resource that we have a lot of and you can come and get it anytime you want um, and, 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 act, and actually provide an economic benefit to our communities as well. Great, thank you. I think those are, those are really good points and it's exciting to see the community coming together and hopefully we can get some more global support, as you're saying, to help with the uptake since as you mentioned, there are small land masses and a, and a huge amount of sargassum. So getting the community together is going to be really, really important. Um, so I'll turn it back over to our moderators now to wrap up the session. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everybody, for coming, uh, all the speakers, for sharing your information and all the, all the great work that you all are doing. For those of you who didn't get your questions answered, I will um, follow up with you um, within the next week or so uh, to try to get all of that squared away. Um, that is the end of our speaker session. Uh, I'll turn it over to Samantha Dowdo, who is a part of the Knowing the Caribbean executive team for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, great. Um, and I just wanted to start by thanking our fantastic presenters and moderators today. Um, and thank you especially for your patience uh, with some glitchy slide advancement. 
um, those were two really fantastic sessions and I know I learned a lot. I'm sure the, the whole community did. So thank you so much um, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, in terms of NOAA and the Caribbean updates, I quickly wanted to note that our spring newsletter will come out in July. If you have any additions um, for either that newsletter or, oh, excuse me, if you have any additions for our summer newsletter, which will come out in September, um, please let Jessica know. I think uh, this slide is probably mistaken. I think it may be a little too late to sneak anything into our spring newsletter, um, but please feel free to reach out to Jessica and she'll make sure that any updates that you may have get into our next issue. Um, and then I also wanted to note that our next community group meeting will be on July 21st from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. If you are interested in speaking, um, please also reach out to Jessica or if you have any recommendations for speakers, we would love to hear from you. Um, or if you would like to be added to our distribution, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, in terms of... Um, getting in touch with us here are some additional ways you can do so. Um, please sign up for our newsletter. Please reach out to us with any newsletter updates and please visit our page on the web. If these QR codes don't work for you, please also don't hesitate to reach out um, to any of us. We'd be happy to direct you to the appropriate resources. I also wanted to take a moment to thank Gino. As he mentioned, he is retiring next week. Uh, we have been so lucky to work with you, Gino. Thank you so much um, for your inspiring career, for contributing and leading this group um, for so many years. It will certainly not be the same without you, but we will do our best um, to continue in your footsteps and um, work to promote collaboration and coordination across uh, the region. So congratulations again uh, on a phenomenal career and fair wind and following seas, Gino. Thank you so much, Sammy. <laughs> and with that, I would like to invite the entire NOAA and the Caribbean executive team um, to please turn on your cameras. I thought I had an extra slide in here just noting um, that if you have any questions about the meeting, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. And we would be really happy to answer any questions you may have um, or put you in touch with those who can. And our meeting materials will um, be posted online in the coming weeks, as Jessica noted. Um, that will include recordings with both English and Spanish subtitles, uh, as well as the presentations that we're able to make available to you all. Um, so Noah and the Caribbean executive team, if you're able to turn your cameras on, I know not everyone is here today, um, but I thought it might be nice to close the webinar with some familiar faces. Thanks, Gino. Um, and I especially wanted to thank Jessica um, for all of her work to pull together this phenomenal meeting today. Um, we're so glad that everyone was able to join us. So thank you, Jessica. We really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. All the best, Gina. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.